Nice to meet you. I come from China and my question is following. What do you think about it, the importance of women in future research? You know, if I understood your question, you have never to worry about this point because it may change one day from you. Now women can do what I could not do when I was a young woman like you are now. So you have not to worry, or women should not, as the future may be very different from what we suspect it will be. So it is not important to believe, it is important always to act in a very ethical way, very rigorous, how you will behave, how you will face difficulty, how you will enjoy good moment, as it goes for me. When you started with research, which problem did you face because you were a woman? For women, it was very difficult, almost impossible, to be a scientist or a social person and a good mother, good wife. Should they have no interest in being a, a professional worker, being women, they should be raised as future mother, wife and mother. I was against this age. So I said, I will never, never be neither a wife nor a mother. But I went to my way. So I did not decide I was not a scientist. I wanted to go with Albert Schweitzer to help against leprosy, which was very diffused at the time in Africa. And I started medicine just to cure leprosy. Rita, what qualities do you think a scientist should have? I am not a scientist. I am more an artist than a scientist. My twin sister died, unfortunately, eight years ago was a very twin, different from me, but excellent person and an artist. My brother was a great architect. I do believe that I confront life, not as a scientist, but as an artist. Never forget that what is important in our life is to be perfectly correct, help as possible as the other, never mind if you are a scientist or an artist. I do work a great deal for women in Africa, and they are very intelligent, but they have been always prevented from study by men who want to impose their own capacity, which is not better than women. Intelligence is equally well distributed between men and women, even if the approach or problem is different. I'm from Italy, and despite my young age, I already had to go abroad working. But I have the dream to come back in Italy and help my country with my job. So you think one day I can come back and work in Italy? Of course. You can do very well, because in Italy we were excellent people. Top, really. We have no problem about intelligence. Italians are very intelligent. It's a gift from Italy and many other countries. So, you can find, if you have any desire to know, you can come to see me in Rome if you want. Uh, do you have any regrets of what you've done in your life? What day? About what you've done in your life, even though it's a really, you've got, you did really, really great things, but have you got still uh, some regrets? No. Nothing? Neither. Never. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't care about uh, believing long, does make a difference. I do believe I had good luck to discover the NJ. Life does not end with your death. What it will survive to you is the way how you send program to other people. I mean, immortality is not your body, which of course is going to die too. I didn't care about dying, because what is important is the message that you give to other people. Who, this is immortality of human being. So when you discovered 
first NGF. Yes. Were you thinking that it would have come to have such a big importance in all no. the possible No, fields? I knew it was a very important against the dogma of the time. I was against dogma and I said no. We are not ad uh, uh, programmed like an insect, because everything changes depending on the environment, if good or bad. The rats do not exist. The rats, is the unfortunately, exist. The death of people, six million women of Jewish people die, because not that they are of inferior race. Einstein, certainly, nobody would think that is inferior race. Is it, I mean, is it right? Bene. Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, truly difficult uh, to uh, take the floor after Rita Levi-Montalcini's interview, and I'm quite concerned. But what I wanted to claim is that Rita helped me found a Brain Circle Italy in 2010, and one of the endeavors that we uh, shared was uh, to disseminate neurosciences, but also promote women in science. With this event uh, titled Emotions, uh, that uh, should uh, have uh, uh, taken place uh, 10 years after Brain Circle, but with COVID, uh, it uh, took 12 years. We wanted to tribute Rita's uh, commitment. And so uh, we really uh, unluckily have to say that uh, unluckily women are uh, the minority of speakers invited to conferences, even if uh, women scientists should take the foreground. And this is why emotions uh, presents them. Cities uh, uh, at the beginning were eight and maybe they will become nine or ten and in every city six female uh, scientists will uh, always be different and here in Milan we devoted our attention to emotions in artificial worlds so to start with emotions emotions is a prejudice as a bias on women. Uh, high thoughts uh, and cognition cannot be uh, shared by uh, women because uh, they are uh, subject to their uh, emotions. Ines Pazzini sent me this uh, message. In 1956, when Aldo Moro presented a bill of law to introduce women in uh, the um, tribunal cause uh, tr in tribunals uh, for minors, uh, he wrote uh, a um, pamphlet, uh, The uh, Female Justice, uh, Grace Against Versus Justice, uh, subtitle, Give Back uh, Mothers to Children and Children to Mothers. Uh, and this was really something that uh, supported that uh, thought. She is a stubborn, uh, light, uh, superficial, uh, emotional, uh, passionate uh, and impulsive, uh, always approximative, uh, linked uh, to logics, uh, and apt uh, to evaluate wisely in uh, the correct uh, scope uh, criminals and offenders. The first uh, competition opened to women was uh, called on May 3rd, 1963, and was uh, won over by six women out of 156. And they entered in, uh, um, uh, in work uh, in 1965. So now there are more women magistrates than men. Thank you, Ines Pazzini. And this links back to what Rita Levi Montacini claims. Once the change is there, then it is an exponential change. Once women enter one field, they enter with uh, excellent exponential um, numbers. Uh, and you will see that this even today with the scientists uh, we will introduce today. It is the first time uh, I'm collaborating with Maria Grazia Mattei in this wonderful uh, meet center. I hope you uh, share my opinion that it is an incredibly beautiful cinema theater and uh, theater and room. So beyond Maria Grazia, I would really like to thank uh, Sami Sarbolla, 
who is an uh, Israeli Mesnet and founded Savon Network and founds a research on uh, in the whole world, Jean Flanol, who has uh, supported us for many years. Mrs. Uh, Lundbeck Company, that is uh, represented here by the CEO. Mrs. Levy, it's beautiful to organize event, uh, events, of course, but if no one supports these events, well, these cannot be organized, and finding support for cultural meetings, it's truly difficult. But luckily, Milan has the Fondazione Cara Cariplo uh, to support them, and we have uh, the scientific uh, and technological director, Mr. Mango. Thank you very much to him, because not only has he supported the uh, foundation of this uh, uh, Milano Meet Center, but also uh, supported us. And uh, cultural meetings are like, you know, uh, Cinderella's when uh, you look for uh, sponsorships. So, going back to the title, Emotions in Virtual Worlds. Why emotions? Well, emotions are of fundamental importance. They were once considered negative traits of women, and now it has been shown that emotional intention is truly important and is predominant in numerous fields, even in economic decisions or in social relation, in the acquisition of cognitive um, abilities. So I really believe that uh, female uh, emotional intelligence is a must uh, to tackle the new challenges of the third millennium and should also be learned by men. So this is an event where females take the floor, but not only for females, but also for males, uh, those males who have been uh, uh, far from their emotions and have to um, be empowered uh, to uh, feel them again. And this is something that we have tackled also in fatherhood uh, in other uh, conferences. So in our present day, in a world that is a uh, change in robot robotics, uh, metaverse, which is a hype, cyborgs. So in this world, how will emotions change? Well, there are numerous theories and hypotheses. Uh, we there is this thought that uh, robots do not have emotions, but instead emotions and interactions are necessary. So how will our emotion change when our reality will be lived and experienced by our avatars? How will our emotion change because our body changes, because we will have uh, grafted chips or uh, prosthetics? And so this is an incredibly beautiful uh, topic, uh, and I will uh, leave the floor to them once uh, they will uh, present their speeches. And now I'd like to give the floor to Maria Grazia uh, Mattei. Uh, but before that, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the uh, Councillor for, uh, um, for Heritage in uh, Milan and uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Matsulai. So I am uh, really uh, uh, very, very excited. Thank you very much for your participation to this extraordinary event. Thank you to all the people in the audience, but especially to Viviana. She has believed in this project that we have uh, organized together. Uh, just a couple of minutes. Uh, to thank all our collaborators uh, and supporters uh, to organize uh, this uh, event. So our uh, very young uh, counselor, uh, and he is the counselor for heritage and culture here in Milan. It's true, Viviana, it's difficult to organize cultural events, uh, but in Milan there is a lot of passion, a drive, energy. This is the Art Week for Milan, and so we are really focusing in speaking uh, about art, and we uh, in event uh, numerous events. And uh, Mr. Mango, Fondazione Cariplo. So very, very briefly, let me tell you where you are. You are in this beautiful room, but you're also within the MEET uh, Urban Center. Well, MEET is a project that was uh, founded with Fondazione Cariplo a couple of years ago to um, characterize uh, and um, 
give uh, importance uh, to all of these events uh, like the one that is organized today and uh, it uh, was uh, that uh, of raising the bar in terms of our relationship with technology and uh, uh, that uh, is a set on cultural uh, change. So once we are aware on technological changes and how we can use it, we can use it creatively. So MEET is a project that has been founded with this aim in mind. And moreover, it is also a, a space and a meeting center which is not only this room, and we have uh, refurbished it thanks to the uh, support of Mr. Carlo Ratti. It is a sort of home, a home where we can breathe the air of innovation, creativity, and art. And this project will continue uh, on other boundaries, uh, and we are trailblazers in this sense. So it's a home for everybody that will host uh, numerous uh, interesting um, events. And I believe and I really hope that at the end of today's uh, uh, day's work, you can also visit uh, this uh, meet a center. So these uh, events uh, like uh, Emotion, the, the daily uh, one we have organized, uh, are uh, amazing uh, events uh, that allow us to ponder upon and reflect uh, on uh, how and what to work on, not only on uh, technology, but especially on uh, digital humanities, uh, so to understand uh, the processes that are underway in our change. So we collaborate with numerous initiatives uh, like uh, uh, the one that is organized uh, today. Why is that? Well, because MEET uh, Center deals with numerous topics, uh, and I'm not going to quote them all, but uh, synergy with uh, uh, Viviana that goes beyond friendship and uh, esteem, of course. So Brain Circle, this project, and uh, uh, Milano Meet Urban Center focuses on uh, gender topics, the involvement of women, uh, their relation with uh, science and technology, so art, science, and technology. And the other strand is the uh, man-machine relation. So we believe that we are living in a moment that is a smart system, not a smart city. We are in a context where a sensor, robotics, uh, IoT, uh, numerous hypes and slogans were launched uh, day after day. Uh, it was a virtual reality yesterday, today it's metaverse. So it's a complex system that focuses on a very advanced cutting edge uh, technologies. Let's think of the sensors we have today. They were not available 10 to five years ago. So it's a dissemination and a daily uh, dissemination of these uh, tools. So it's a complex uh, ecosystem that intertwines all of these technologies that are based on, on research of uh, AI algorithms for which reason, why uh, is uh, all this happening? Well, I believe, and today we're going to shed light on this, that one of the themes, uh, a smart system, is a positive attempt to understand uh, how technological, uh, uh, digital, so sorry, technology will uh, be uh, disseminated and uh, understand the complexity of our times. So this complexity cannot be merely managed with local governmental uh, bodies. We need more evolved uh, technologies to govern this uh, complexity. And so I want to focus on a positive use of technology. So this is the point of view, this is our context. So the uh, man-machine uh, relation uh, where we have uh, characterized emotions is very important today because there are a number of things of questions uh, that come up. Uh, why, what is the, the reason why we do this, the meaning, what type of relations, what type uh, of um, uh, direction, and Carlo, I believe, uh, will uh, 
uh, focus on this because he's a, a scientist. So this is the context, this is the point of view. And clearly enough, uh, our change, our emotional uh, uh, change when we consider the uh, relations that we all have when we enter the digital dimension, physical and digital, when we become avatars with uh, multifaceted personalities uh, have uh, ethical and moral and moral questions and uh, in the uh, program uh, in the lineup that we have today i was really uh, astonished because every speaker every scientist touches upon very important aspects uh, that have to do with our uh, new relations uh, with technologies and machines. So many, many thanks, uh, Viviana. And at the end of today's uh, work, you are invited to a tour of uh, the uh, center. Now I would like to invite Mr. Carlo Mango. And uh, uh, I would also like to thank uh, the audience, uh, the people who are uh, following us uh, from uh, home uh, that are connected via our website, emotion.org. And also thank all the people who have collaborated with us because it was uh, a lot of work. Uh, Barbara Levy of Meet, uh, Marta Bocchicchio, my assistant, Luisa Capelli, who is in Rome and who has uh, organized the live streaming, and Sardocchini, who is a co another collaborator who works here at Milano Meet uh, Urban Center and all the other collaborators. You have the floor, Carlo, and thank you for your presence here. Thanks to you, emotions is also a, a topic uh, that uh, shows that we are no longer used to meeting in presence in a wonderful uh, theater like this one. So Maria Grazia, Viviana, thank you very much uh, for all uh, the uh, things that you have done, Maria Grazia, for this beautiful uh, center. There's a lot uh, that uh, has to be done when you focus uh, on, uh, the, uh, on, on running a space such as this. So today, the emotions, it's a precious uh, uh, topic. Uh, first of all, because uh, we have uh, a representation of the world that will be presented by our uh, uh, female friends, our female scientists. I would just like to focus on two aspects. First off, science. Well, this is a, a, a topic, uh, science and art. They, uh, these two topics both have a problem. There is uh, this uh, difficulty in uh, creating uh, the affect to uh, support them uh, financially. Because you see, and I do that too, we are not able uh, to uh, sort of uh, set up that marketing aspect uh, uh, so as to uh, create uh, spin-offs, uh, positive spin-offs of uh, these uh, effects. So if we're here today, it's because science has uh, a lot to uh, say. We really have a great need for scientific evidence, not merely based, uh, data evidence based, but we need to robustly support our data. And this has uh, come out with in all of the debates uh, that have to do with science. Today we're going to speak about emotions, AI, and I always wonder, how much intelligence do we need? The last thing I did today, I had uh, breakfast with my wife that represents uh, that part uh, of intelligence that I lack. And uh, uh, especially in the relations. And then the other thing I did uh, is read the three dailies I work, uh, I read, sorry, every day. And the intelligence uh, and the ability to integrate our intelligence is a requirement. And something else that refers uh, to uh, what we're going to talk uh, about today is that if you uh, leaf through all of the dailies that are printed in uh, Italy, for the first half of the news and articles, there, is, there are no women. So we're speaking of negotiations, of talks, uh, of men who uh, have uh, done uh, important and fundamental aspects. 
And uh, these are all men. And then the second topic I would like to highlight is linked to uh, the science and uh, the uh, heritage uh, that is uh, held by women. Let me give you a snapshot. Our foundation is uh, known because with other organizations we support the careers of young researchers. And when they uh, re uh, compete on uh, scientific research, medical research, well, women are uh, high achievers. Uh, they perform very well. And so the gender balance should be very, very different. Then, when we launch uh, calls for consolidated researchers, then the gender balance is completely different. And when we consider innovation in the deep tech, for example, that is uh, s closely linked with the science in its enhancement, well, there we lose uh, something that is very important uh, uh, because in the world of innovation and the uh, European Commissioner for Research uh, claimed this, uh, in big tech and innovation, there is a big challenge that we have to win over because we have few uh, female entrepreneurships in uh, high density startups for research. And these are all topics uh, which uh, we should work on. Therefore, many, many thanks uh, uh, for what you've done to organ organize our um, uh, present uh, uh, day's work. I will sit in the audience uh, and listen very, very carefully to all of our uh, speakers. Well, thank you very much. Now I would like to leave the floor to a woman who is a success story in the academic uh, world, Maria Pia Bracchio, neuroscientist, uh, who is a, a vicar, um, a vice dean of the Statale University here in Milan. And we're very, very happy to have you here with us. Thank you, Viviana, for your invite in this beautiful uh, venue. Thank you, Maria Grazia, Viviana. Thank you to Brain Circle Italia, Brain Forum, Fondazione Cariplo, that has uh, supported this event and allows us uh, to be here today. So I'm extremely happy to be here, not only to uh, share the greetings and welcome of uh, the Università degli Studi of Milan that uh, Mr. Mango knows is a forum of uh, um, scientists, uh, male and females alike, uh, who deal with neurosciences and uh, that to study the role of digitization of AI and machine learning within uh, the uh, field of neurosciences. So I am a neuroscientist and I am here to learn a lot uh, today and uh, I am uh, really uh, happy to uh, share the knowledge uh, of uh, uh, the matter we are studying, our brain. I have three things to focus on. Viviana has written an article where she claims, and I uh, agree with her, that today we are here to destroy biases, prejudices, and a fight against dogmas. And uh, our uh, Rita Levi Moncalcini focused on dogmas. Uh, she uh, claimed she did not believe in them, and it's true because a real scientist. Uh, uh, proceeds uh, by uh, rejecting uh, dogmas uh, and uh, um, trying uh, to um, eschew them. And so the uh, humility in the face of knowledge, uh, trying to uh, study data, what the data is showing, the evidence is showing. Second aspect, uh, emotions. Uh, this uh, lineup that you have uh, uh, put together is extremely important. Uh, emotions were considered uh, something that should be hidden, that we should be ashamed of, that we should not uh, show, that uh, uh, kept uh, uh, numerous uh, women uh, far from important ca careers. Viviana spoke about uh, women magistrates in the 60s, so not too far away in time. And uh, they have uh, shied away from science as well. Emotions 
on the contrary, are essential in life. Everything starts with emotions. And so just let me convey two examples, the importance of emotions in learning and in our social relations. We learn because of emotions. Since uh, um, we were uh, babies, uh, when we're close to our mothers, uh, the emotions of the smell of uh, uh, mothers when breastfed, uh, recognizing and listening to the heartbeat, uh, the scent of uh, the milk, that uh, stimulates uh, and evokes uh, the um, cognition of self. And this is an extremely important aspect that uh, is achieved uh, thanks to physicality and this uh, we have missed uh, during the pandemic. So these are all tactile, uh, acoustic and sight uh, emotions that allow our brain uh, to grow and develop. Only sound in uh, the brain allow the uh, hearing cortex to develop and allow us to hear and feel light uh, and uh, visual stimuli entering our eyes allow the uh, eye cortex to develop and allow us to see because when we are born we do not see and then tactile feelings and uh, that uh, guide us look at the agno educational development, uh, look at the studies that have been carried out on uh, children and maths, uh, counting on fingers that uh, is uh, uh, back to being essential to generate the concept of numbers uh, through the emotions uh, and the concept of touching the fingers, which are indispensable for life. Moreover, we are able to be in relations with the exterior world, not only to learn. When we see a person who expresses an emotion, not only uh, do I share the emotion with others, but when I see someone who is uh, experience, uh, experiences a, an uh, emotion, a mirror and neurons are activated, and numerous studies uh, show that uh, that uh, show that when an uh, something generates a neurons, a mirror neurons uh, replicate this uh, same uh, situation in our brain generating empathy. If I feel empathy, I understand what is occurring around me. Without empathy, I am lost in the world. And so empathy means solidarity, means uh, sharing, means understanding what is occurring in another person's head, means uh, Generating compassion towards our race, towards our species, means uh, uh, creating a protection uh, towards ourselves, uh, to our um, common uh, uh, individuals. Species uh, would not exist if emotions do not exist. So these should not be hidden. We need them to live. We all feel emotions, not only females, even men. Even uh, Rita Levi-Moncelcini claimed that when she said brain has uh, an identical patrimony. We are all born uh, the same. Uh, some are more talented than others, but the human brain capital is identical. The epigenetic is important, i.e. the environment that shapes us and educates us. We all start from the same capital holding, but in the past, uh, the uh, male capital uh, was uh, enhanced. The female one uh, was uh, instead uh, suppressed. Now, thank you very much. Let me give the floor to Tommaso Sacchi, uh, Councillor for Culture and Heritage of uh, the Milan uh, Municipality. A man. Yes, I'm a man. I have uh, had uh, an, a perfect uh, uh, introduction and an excellent speaker before me. Well, very rarely uh, it occurs to me that I'm a minority, so um, this is something I'm very, very happy about. And luckily this is uh, something that rarely occurs in numerous public occasions, well, there is a prevalence uh, of, uh, of men. 
So this testimony and this uh, possibility of listening to these uh, glances, to the uh, uh, um, an experience of uh, uh, the uh, professors and scientists and researchers uh, that you have uh, invited uh, will be extremely important for Milan. And this occurs uh, not by chance, uh, by uh, a person, Maria Grazia uh, Mattei, uh, Milanese a woman uh, who is uh, the uh, inventor and creator of this beautiful venue and location. So thank you, Viviana and Maria Grazia, for their daily work uh, that they uh, do with uh, a lot of passion, but especially with a lot of competence. Now, back to our uh, topic uh, today, we will reflect uh, even at political and institutional level, and this uh, uh, goes to say that I uh, also represent uh, our mayor, Mr. Sala, in uh, welcoming you here today. Well, I have a couple of things uh, to say. We are uh, um, meeting today in uh, um, the um, Art Week, where uh, visual arts, uh, arts uh, and uh, science uh, should uh, be in dialogue more and more. So this is, uh, I believe, this uh, meeting today has uh, been uh, organized uh, in the midst of the Art uh, Week. Meet will be an important uh, uh, piece of the puzzle of the Art Week. And uh, uh, all the most important institutions uh, that propose art, uh, that propose uh, reflections and glances uh, to our modern world are represented by the Meet Urban uh, Center. And so uh, this uh, event, uh, Emotions, is a very important part of the Art Week. Yesterday, I was talking to another important uh, protagonist of uh, our city, Fiorenzo Galli, uh, director of the Museum of Science and Technology, which has uh, as a, a, a pillar the seven uh, wise men of Melotti, so a pillar that uh, binds it together the intellectual uh, and uh, artistic uh, uh, knowledge and know-how. And uh, uh, focusing on, again, on sculpture and female worlds, I would also like to remind you that Milan devoted uh, the first uh, uh, work of art devoted uh, to a, a woman in science, Margarita Hack. She needs uh, no presentation, but uh, I was really moved, by the way, listening to Rita Levi Montalcini earlier. Thank you very much, because sharing that interview with us uh, is really uh, you know, um, something uh, uncommon, this 100-year-old uh, lady that talks about her career with great simplicity in that uh, green lawn, who, who nonetheless uh, disseminates uh, uh, and shares with us uh, the importance of her studies, her research that directed the fate of uh, a certain uh, aspect of research um, in these important fields. But um, even Margarita Hack was a great woman and uh, made uh, uh, Italy extremely, extremely important. So many, many thanks even to the uh, Vicar uh, Dean of the Università Statale and in fact in uh, the court of the, uh, Università Statale there will be a work of art that uh, will uh, uh, bring us back to that great tool that Margarita Hack used uh, to um, manipulate uh, with a great uh, uh, know-how Moreover, I would also like to remind you today that many uh, young uh, people uh, are going to be present here today. Meat has been, this Meat Center has been invented, in fact, to see this happen. 
i.e. an event where uh, uh, women have been invited to focus on themes that are really a must for us. We really must focus on them. We have just, uh, uh, we are trying to end uh, the um, pandemic uh, situation, getting out of two years of time that we really hope to be as short as possible and instead lasted two years. We're now getting uh, out of this uh, suffering and distance uh, of social relations and, uh, uh, and uh, we could not share uh, artistic uh, venues. And by closing now, I would like to say that this part of the city, thanks to the work of uh, the uh, Meet Digital Culture Center, which has been a, a precursor for the uh, scientific uh, aspect in a city like Milan, will change. So this uh, square where we are located uh, for those who know uh, the uh, urban planning of Milan, uh, the square, Piazza Obernan, I mean, I was away from uh, Milan for seven years because I worked uh, previously in Florence. And then uh, I back in Milan, my city, and uh, this uh, uh, shows uh, uh, my work uh, here in art and culture and heritage uh, in urban planning in this uh, uh, square, uh, Oberdan Square, which will really replicate the way in which uh, Milan uh, will uh, uh, change. Uh, this uh, used to be uh, the um, auteur cinema, uh, the uh, Oberdan uh, Cinema Theater, and uh, thanks to uh, Carlo Ratti, it was uh, uh, designed uh, to change and it has uh, become what it is uh, today. Meet is not only this beautiful multimedia uh, theater, but th there is also the MAD, the Museum of uh, Digital Art uh, that we are designing with the Minister for Culture, Mr. Uh, Franceschini, Mrs. Bonacossi, who is working with uh, uh, Maria Grazia uh, Mattei, so as uh, to be the new trajectory that culture in Milan will take. So thank you very much. Thank you. April 21st at the Gabi Foundation and I am one of the members of the scientific committee. We will have an exhibition at the Biennale in Venice on the brain. Now, we will be talking about brain as a work of art. So it is a scientific exhibition. We will um, analyze brain and uh, this is a very interesting change also in terms of scientific culture. We'd like to thank the city of Milan for their, uh, you know, uh, well, support them. This is an extraordinary city. Now, we have started a little later. Uh, speeches won't be followed by questions. There will also be a coffee break. It's very particular of music. We also have Sebastiano Cognolato. We have uh, a Japanese uh, piano player. We will use uh, uh, headsets or helmets, so they will capture the waves from their emotions, um, and these waves will, if you will, animate, so to say, some pictures and origamis and uh, butterflies, I mean, depending on the emotions of uh, listeners. Okay, so after the coffee break, you will be invited to listen to this. Now, Alessandra Schutti is our first scientist. Three scientists come uh, today from ITI from Genoa, where they do science and technology. So once again, Alessandra Schutti is very young. She's now managing the contact unit ar cognitive architecture for collaborative technologies uh, at this uh, institution. 
and she works with our cup humanoid, which is a small robot. Um, it learns like children do. It's an open platform with scientists from all over the world. Um, she has uh, a master degree in uh, humanoid technologies. Mrs. Shuti spent uh, some time for research purposes in the US and in Japan. He also, uh, she also managed to have a starting grant, uh, a fund from the uh, European Research Council for the development uh, of the WISPER research project aiming at establishing mutual understanding between humans and robots. She has written more than 80 um, articles. She's an expert in uh, uh, men robo interaction. She has received uh, many awards. Uh, inspiring 50. Okay, but you're not 50. Why 50? You're not 50 back in 2018 and the uh, techno visionaries or techno visionari in italian award she studies uh sensory motor and cognitive mechanisms which are right at the foundations of human interactions so the main objective is technology and designing robots able to interact naturally with people this is really really very important we know for example that in japan almost all the, um, uh, let's say, caregivers are now represented by robo uh, system. Okay, Alessandra, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank Viviana for this nice introduction. Now, um, we want to know what intelligence is, don't we? and how we can transfer at least uh, one part in our machines so they can help us. Unfortunately, for quite a long time, we have associated intelligence uh, to our logical skills. So this means that the researchers and developers focused on this point only, so making machines smart or intelligent being able to solve complex logical tasks, for example, playing chess. Now, machines are better than us in playing chess, but they also play, well, very complex um, games, for example, Go or Deep Blue. We understood this is not enough. So this is something that's not enough for us. So, question number one. So, this is forced to stay in a virtual world. They have no body. They cannot interact with our world. So, plenty of research was dedicated to developing bodies. So, robots that made giant steps forward. Look at humanoids. So, even if you just consider this sector, you see robots having incredible skills. They can jump, they do the so-called parkour. Uh, are we happy with this? So um, have we created the real platform able to cooperate with us? Uh, the real uh, intelligent or smart one? No. Because you know, quite often these machines which are able to carry out incredible actions, I mean, they play chess, but they make mistakes. So we have a robot jumping backward, but then uh, it doesn't know when to give me an object or, for example, uh, shaking hands with Angela Merkel. Robots can do some things that um, you know people cannot do, and they are not able to interact with us, uh, which is what these children uh, can do. So this is an incredible set of skills that we develop very early so we understand things we know when we have to do something together this is a paradox based on a partial vision of uh, cognition or intelligence in general um, neurosciences uh, have considered if you will the mind and the brain as if they were to separate uh, items so our skills were sort of uh, um, disjoint, separated from our body or emotions. 
Well, this is a wrong vision or perspective because this is what someone discovered, uh, well, sort of, not, not well, many years ago. Uh, this is an artificial separation or split. Uh, you can see here the uh, words from Antonio Damasio, a neuroscientist, and uh, he wrote a book, uh, The uh, Error of Carthasian. So, um, emotions are not a plus or a luxury. They are one of the key elements of the fact that we are rational. First and foremost, emotions play a vital role from the communication point of view. They give you a general idea of how I feel inside, but they also have a crucial role in our decision-making skills, as uh, um, scientist Damasio says. If there are injuries or lesions on the emotional part of the brain, well, those people cannot make rational decisions. So we have to know and learn that we are something more than simple rationality. I mean, our own rational attitude is an across-the-board uh, dimension, also including emotions. This means we have to also recognize another thing. We see the world in a way which is completely different uh, versus what our robots do. And, uh, you know, this happens because we sort of color our reality, we change it. Uh, it depends on how we are, how we are made, how we feel on the side. And, uh, you know, this uh, means something different. We don't see the world um, the way it is. We don't take pictures of reality. I mean, our perception is much more complex. It's an inference. This means that um, all the time, at, at all times, uh, our brain takes in the stimuli, but then uh, it enriches them. It sort of fills the gaps by taking advantage of information based on our past experience. We just don't realize this is happening until something goes wrong. We just understand this when the mechanism, which is usually perfect, well, we have some visual illusions. Maybe we don't understand something correctly. This happens on the perceptive but also cognitive levels. For example, we don't remember things for what they are. Our brain changes reality to uh, help us understand reality and interact with the others. We see the world through anthropomorphous eyes or lenses. It's sort of you know, distorted. Well, this dates back to uh, so uh, long ago in terms of um, perceptions of other people. This is what um, um, Darwin said. How can I understand emotions of another person? Well, actions are, uh, well, they speak louder than pictures. It's true, we mentioned mirror neurons. Well, we do have some mechanisms that give us the possibility to read beyond the actions performed by someone else. Uh, this is a robot. Now, when the robot sees this action, well, uh, he sees a movement, uh, so an object moving from A to B. So when I see this action, what do I actually see? Well, I see the objective. So Carlo is giving an object to the robot. So there's an intention there from the look, the, the posture of Carlo, of this guy. So um, a sort of an interaction with Ica, okay? So there's, um, you know, nice communication. So this tells me something more about the uh, relationship with the object. All of this information is to be used implicitly when I interact with Carlo. You know, the robot right now is blind. I mean, uh, his information blind. So this is what we do. We would like to give this robot the uh, possibility to understand us and to be understood by us. So it acts in the world in a smart, intelligent way, but what we want is a uh, relationship from him. So we use, uh, uh, well, ICAP uh, as a platform because um, actually 
uh, it, well, basically it was created some years ago. It is a platform to study the human cognition. The European Multidisciplinary Project uh, behind the ICAB uh, aimed at understanding an intelligence system, just like a human a child, rebuilding a part of these skills into a robot. Now, ICAB, uh, well, we have not just one, we have 50 ICAMs in different uh, research centers around the world. We share, you know, uh, information and uh, he's now become famous. And you can see that Angela Merkel has learned how to interact with robots. So she's now imitating iCub. So in this context, uh, what we do is creating a mutual understanding. I mean, being able to read uh, the uh, unsaid language. You know, those communications that take place under the uh, awareness surface, uh, a look, a gesture, a posture, a trembling voice, so some simple elements. We don't realize this is happening, but we use this all the time to create a model of the other, to foresee uh, how another person will react, for example. So uh, we want to create a sensitive uh, robot understanding our face uh, expressions, understanding our reaction to what he has just done. Uh, just think of training or rehab. Maybe you can have a, a robot which is able to monitor our performances, so if we are doing great or not, but um, they can also, well, he can also understand uh, if I'm tired, uh, if I, uh, I'm involved or not. So we can adjust training not just in terms of performances, but also considering affection or the uh, internal feelings or status of that person. So we want to read face expressions. Uh, we communicate with movements. And for example, now ICAB will be able to read this information, understanding uh, how to treat an object without understanding which kind of object it's manipulating, okay, just by observing how we manipulate it. Another source of fundamental information is our look. Uh, our look speaks about our intentions. It can also reveal our cognitive load, so how difficult I'm finding doing something. So ICAB is now understanding or reading uh, this information. For example, look at this. We have, um, we have some cards. ICAP monitors our look. He tries to understand uh, uh, which card this is and uh, if we are lying or if we are telling the truth. A sensitive robot means we can help him adapt to us, understand us, and um, we can make it even more, uh, well, let's say, easier to understand. So if I understand what I am sensitive to, well, of course, I will base all of my behaviors so as to be transparent, clear, and predictable. For example, um, we need to understand how to allow ICAP to move correctly, to express uh, our kind movements or aggressive movements. Now, these signals are felt very clearly inside of us. I mean, there are some areas of our brain specially conceived to distinguish the style of our actions. So. Will a robot be able to distinguish, I mean, all of these styles? Well, we have worked a lot uh, to reproduce the so-called signature of an aggressive behavior in the behavior of ICAB. Now, if this is done correctly, well, actually, the neural uh, response uh, in those areas of the observer's brain is exactly the same when observing a robot or a person expressing, you know, a kind, nice attitude or an aggressive one. If we develop the robot's behaviors correctly, well, the robots will be able to use the same, if you will, neural mechanisms, which is what we use on a daily basis when we interact with other people. Now, this is interesting from a scientific point of view, but this is so important from the application of behavioral perspective. For example, we saw that um, if the robot moves in an aggressive way, well, when I have to interact with objects, well, I become more aggressive automatically. So we need to modulate, you know, the uh, uh, movement 
so as to completely change the action evolution. Now, these are just some examples of the so many signals that we can study to make robots more aware of what happens. Um, so, we can study man or humans to understand signals and mechanisms, but then we can translate all of them onto the robots so as to challenge them during the interaction. So what's the next step then? Well, this is our new frontier, giving the robot the possibility to use skills uh, independently. So being able to understand man, then adapting and uh, customizing interactions in a predictive way. Now, uh, yes, this is definitely difficult. It means we have to develop a cognitive architecture, something that you know merges perceptions, actions, uh, memory, planning, prediction. So all of this is right inside our robots. Now, uh, this was a huge research effort uh, having to do with neurosciences, uh, cognitive scientists, uh, robotics scientists. Now. If we uh, consider all of the cognitive architectures developed so far, we can see that the real inspiration uh, is exactly what you see here. A child, well, uh, very smart, intelligent, creative, uh, you know, thanks to curiosity, he or she can interact with the environment, but uh, he's there with no one else. So look at what happens with this child at that age, the social dimension but also the affective dimension, if you will, is absolutely overwhelming. Now, uh, maybe you don't understand this happens in the cognitive architectures we have in the world today. Now, there's a beautiful paper here. Now, in this paper, uh, you can see a sort of um, a meta-analysis of 40 years of cognitive architectures, uh, collecting the basic foundational principles, something that you can find across all architectures. Now, authors have identified important hints, perception, action selection, memory, of course. Now, take a look closer. There's nothing that clearly concerns uh, the affective or social uh, pillars. So this is our effort today. We have to try and add this dimension, which is absolutely uh, cognitive per se. We will fit it into the architectures uh, that we have inside our robo. Now, this is an example of what I'm saying. We are reproducing the two key uh, features I have just mentioned. Uh, emotion is uh, um, sort of a communication system. Emotion is also a thrust or a guiding star so that we can make the right, hopefully, decision. So you can see here, ICAP uh, looks at the uh, face expressions of the person. He can express, uh, uh, well, face expressions, once again, in a very simple way. But then inside, there's motivation. So he's looking for comfort, uh, which is what we defined in the following way, growing depending on the increasing number of social interactions. Now, this is a simple architecture, I know. But anyway, we saw that the uh, robot, which is based autonomously on this architecture, where he learns uh, how to personalize his interactions. He becomes communicative, interactive with the people he wants to interact with. And then he's a little, you know, skeptical, so he doesn't really get involved in people he doesn't like. Now, this is a lab example, I know, but the same principles can also be widened and broadened and structured into more complex architectures. And the, all of this can turn into practice. And again, this is an example where ICAB is a sort of a yoga um, teacher. Now, autonomously, independently, in real time, he corrects uh, the uh, unfit, incorrect positions. At the same time, he learns uh, the key features of every single um, trainees. Thanks to uh, different meetings uh, or encounters, uh, training systems will be uh, uh, personalized based on the needs of every trainee. Now, we have a long way to go, but um, the objective we have is really key. We want to make sure robots will become more human. Wait a second, they won't look like us. When I say more human, I mean they really have to understand us more. They have to be able to, uh, well, to count on a correct model. They will adjust and adapt to us. 
they won't just be precious, valuable, you know, tools with plenty of skills that we have, you know, to, to control. Well, they will become partners or collaborators. This being said, I really would like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank this incredible team, boys and girls, making this research paper possible. Thank you so much. Well, thank you and congratulations. Um, without further ado, let me give the floor to another researcher from ITI, Agnieszka Bikowska. Agnieszka comes from Poland, but she's been working at ITI in general for many years. She's now coordinating the Social Cognition in Human-Robot Interaction Group, which is exactly what we have just heard. Agnieszka got uh, a prestigious grant. Instance International stands for Social Attunement from the European Research Council. Again, she's editor-in-chief, International Journal of Social Robotics. She's uh, chairwoman of the European Society for Cognitive and Affective Neurosciences. She's also a member of uh, HERA, so the European Research Area Forum, uh, European Commission, member states and uh, academics and researchers. They talk about science and politics at a European and international level. So a prestigious career. Agnieszka will be speaking English. Uh, we have the simultaneous translation service available. Agnieszka, thank you so much for being here this morning. Floor goes to you. For this uh, kind introduction, thank you for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure and a great honor. Thank you so much. Um, today I'll talk to you about human-robot interaction as well, similarly to Alessandra, but I'll take a different uh, point of view. I'll talk about humans interacting with robots. So Alessandra was telling you about how to make robots more capable of social interactions with us. I'll tell you a story about us humans. How do we actually perceive robots? How do we treat them? Do we treat them as intentional social agents? Or do we treat them as mindless machines? So um, after Alessandra's um, introduction to ICAB, I think I don't need to introduce ICAB anymore. My work is also very much um, uh, done with, with ICAB and humans, as I said. So I'll start with an extract from a movie that you probably have, uh, most of you probably have seen. And here it goes. Could machines ever think as human beings do? Most people say not. You're not most people. Well, the problem is you're asking a stupid question. I am? Of course machines can't think as people do. A machine is different from a person. Hence they think differently. The interesting question is, just because something uh, thinks differently from you, does that mean it's not thinking? All right, I'll leave you with that last question. Uh, if something th thinks differently, does it mean it's not thinking? This is the light motive of our research, uh, of the research of my group that I'll uh, present here. And uh, the question is, um, do us humans attribute thought processes, feelings, emotions to robots? In other words, more philosophical terms, do we adopt the intentional stance towards robots? So what is the intentional stance? As I said, it's a philosophical concept. And the idea here is that we as humans need to be able to explain and predict behaviors of our system, uh, other systems in the environment. So um, we find strategies to be able to explain what is happening. With, our, with other humans, we adopt the intentional stance, meaning we attribute mental states to humans. So when I see someone grasping for a glass, I uh, explain their behavior that they wanted to drink, that they uh, believed that water will ease their thirst. Wanting, believing, 
Um, these are mental states. However, if a coffee machine stops pouring coffee, or a car stops because I push the brake pedal, I don't say that the car wanted to stop. I don't explain the behavior of the coffee machine that it wanted to be mean to me and stop pouring coffee. No, I explain the behavior that was designed to behave in such a way. Now, you can probably already see that robots might actually fall in between these two categories, especially humanoid robots, because they uh, look like humans, they might behave like humans, but yet, there are artifacts. So the question is, will we actually attribute thoughts and feeling processes to those machines? So that's the key question here, the intentional stance towards robots. And the first challenge that we have met in my lab was to actually operationalize this question. What does that mean? This is a philosophical question. How do you actually put a philosophical question into empirical research? How do you quantify if someone adopts intentional stance or not? So in order to do that, we developed this kind of test the intentional stance test, where people see scenarios like those one that you see here on the screen, and they have two types of descriptions of the scenario, of what is happening in the scenario. And one uh, description is with intentional terms, ICAP was trying to cheat, right? And the other uh, description is very mechanical. ICAP was unbalanced. And people can choose by moving this slider which description they think fits best. And this way, we can sort of measure how much people attribute intentionality or thought processes to robots. Now, the interesting question that we have asked was, can we then identify at the neural level um, what uh, sort of neural processes are underlying this kind of attribution of mental states towards robots. So we have learned that humans do adopt intentional stance to robots to some extent, and we have learned that from this test that I just showed you. And now what we wanted to do is um, redo this test while we measure uh, people's brain activity, as you see here with um, EEG. And based on this activity, we wanted to see whether we would be able to predict what sort of attitude a person would have. In order to do that, we asked our participants to uh, first, before giving them any task, to just sit, come to the, our lab, we prepare the head, we put the, neuron, uh, the EEG cap on, and we ask them that just to relax. So it's called a uh, resting state EEG. They are uh, just thinking of anything they want to think while we're measuring their brain activity. And after that, um, we look at the data, and what we actually found is that we were able to predict from their brain activity whether they would attribute intentional stance, ad um, adopt intentional stance or attribute mental states to the robot, or adopt the design stance. And this is quite striking, because maybe someday in the future, we'll be able to predict from neural activity of uh, our participants, users, what sort of attitude they will have towards a robot. Because at the end of the day, intentional stance is an attitude. I treat a robot as an intentional agent, social agent, or I treat it as a machine. And that has consequences for how I will re interact with the robot later. Uh, so, um, these data showed us that individual preference towards the intentional stance can be actually decoded from neural activity at rest. All right, um, so far I told you about people's spontaneous um, stance towards robots, but the question of interest is, can we actually modulate the stance by various factors? For example, uh, Human-like shape, for sure, may, plays a role in whether we attribute mental states or not. Human-like behavior as well, and perhaps social-emotional bonding, something that I think is the theme of, of today and probably uh, most fits to the th theme of, of uh, this meeting. So, um, I'll talk about the two um, uh, latter uh, points. 
the human-like behavior and social-emotional bond bonding. So we thought that uh, perhaps when we pr um, create an atmosphere where um, robots and humans are doing tasks together in such a way that they feel the robot being their teammate or they feeling that they are their kind of social partners in an activity that they would do otherwise with other uh, humans, um, maybe that would make people more likely to adopt intentional stance towards uh, the robot. Why? Because if a robot plays with me or does a social activity with me, the robot is more like me, especially if it behaves more human-like. Therefore, I'll be more likely to attribute mental states to the robot because I attribute them to myself as well, right? Um, so we created a task where participants um, did the test that I just told you before an interaction with the robot, then they interacted with the robot, and then we did the test again after, and we wanted to see if actually this test would, uh, so the score would increase, so they would adopt more intentional stance. In the task, we thought, what is a sort of a social emotional bonding situation in, in our lives that we would usually do? And we thought of going to the cinema together. We would go to the cinema, we watch movies with our partners. So why don't we create a situation where the robot and the human watch a movie together and the robot, importantly, in one condition, behaves in a human-like way because it will react to the events on the screen in a very human-like way, uh, emotional way, and in another condition would be very mechanical. So let me show you the um, experimental manipulation. So what you see here is what they're seeing actually on the screen that they're watching together. <laughs> and you see that the human cannot stop, like uh, they cannot help but laugh together with the robot. This is social emotional binding, right? Bonding. Um, so, in fact, after we presented this to our participants, their scores in intentional stance tests increased, meaning they adopted more intentional stance in the human-like condition. But in the mechanical condition, where the robot was just beeping, it went like beep, 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 beep. Um, in that condition, there was no difference before and after in terms of treating robots as intentional agents. Another task that we've done in a very similar way was uh, team play where um, the human and the robot had to do a task together and the task was to move a cursor to a target but they had two complementary roles. So one um, uh, partner had to move the cursor and the other one had to um, confirm that the um, cursor is already on the target. And this is how it looks. You see the cursor going and now the, particip the human participant had to uh, confirm. In this case, when they were playing together, we again saw an increase of adoption of the intentional stance, so increase of attribution of mental states to the robot. And so based on these uh, data, we can say that social-emotional bonding and sharing tasks increase the likelihood of adopting the intentional stance. But now the question is, can we also uh, take the intentional stance down and actually decrease the likelihood of adopting the intentional stance. So in this experiment, we ask our participants to play in a duet uh, with the robot, uh, play a musical uh, sort of sequence. And in one condition, the robot was making errors, but human-like errors. In another one, very mechanical errors. Let me show you how it looked. <laughs> Now it happened, it played the wrong, it played the wrong tap. And you'll see in a moment uh, the mechanical error, which will be very clearly uh, mechanical. I'm sorry that you will probably hear repeating this. And you see the robot goes into a loop back and forth, and this is something that wouldn't happen to a human typically. So with this kind of manipulation, we actually observed what you see there uh, in, uh, in the data, we observed that people, after playing with a mechanically erring error, um, robot, they decreased 
the likelihood of attributing mental states to the robot. And interestingly, there was another very interesting uh, behavior that we observed on the humans. They also increased, um, sorry, de de they decreased variability in the way they were performing the task in the human-like condition. And decrease of variability is a way of signaling between us the willingness to cooperate. We try to be more predictable when we want to cooperate. So that is very interesting to see that humans were kind of implicitly signaling to the human-like uh, um, robot that they are willing to cooperate. All right, machine-like robot erring decreases adoption of the intentional stance and cooperation be behavior. So the final part of my talk will be about nonverbal communication and other social mechanisms, not only the intentional stance. And Alessandra was talking about a lot of social signals that we display in social interactions. One of them is mutual gaze. That is extremely important, looking into eyes of one another. So what does it mean to look into the eyes of a robot. Does this actually activate in our brain social cognitive mechanisms? Do we treat this as a social signal? Because with other humans, it's an extremely potent signal. We know it all, right? Um, but here the question is, these two cameras in a robot, are they treated like eyes? Are they treated like a social signal? So we designed an experiment in which this time participants played a competitive game with a robot. It's a very funny game because they had each of the partners, so the, the human had a kind of simulated car, the robot had a car as well, the cars were going in to one another, it was of course on a screen. And if the cars went too close to each other, they would crash and they would lose a lot of points. But if the human went straight ahead and the robot deviated, then the human won and vice versa. So um, one needed to sort of take a little bit of a risk in this game, but the important manipulation was that when they were making the decision about whether I want to go straight ahead or deviate, um, the robot either gazed at them or gazed away. And this is kind of a poker situation. I'm just about to make my next move, and my competitor is looking in my eyes. What do I do? Do I bluff? Um, so uh, basically, this is how it, uh, the experiment looked. You see the cars, they stop, and this is the moment when the robot actually looks at participants or looks away. We measured a participant's EEG signal as well, and our data show that when the robot looked at them, this delayed participants' decision. So this really affected the way they were able to play in that game. And again, in you know, a poker kind of situation, that could be detrimental for them. So that means that our brain has processes this kind of signal as a social signal. And we also see it at the neural level that actually this kind of mutual gaze made a huge difference in our brain in the brain activity of our participants. Okay, uh, the very final uh, part of my talk is about social signals again, um, but I will focus on the application area. Because the question is like, why do we even bother with creating social robots? Why do we want to have intentional agents around us that are artificial? What difference does it make? And I'll tell you that, yes, it does make a difference. It does make a difference for clinical applications. So uh, robots can be very helpful in um, being assistance for training and therapy for children diagnosed with autism. This is because there's a lot of research now uh, showing that children with autism open up uh, towards artificial agents. They're very um, much more likely to interact and engage in a therapy with a robot than with a human therapist. So if that's the case, then perhaps we can use this opportunity and actually use robots to help them training social skills. And this is the direction we're going um, in, in IIT with, with my team and in collaboration with um, um, uh, Bojano Pico, this is a part of uh, Foundation Don Orione, a rehabilitation center in Genoa where uh, there are 
uh, kids diagnosed with autism and also other neurodevelopmental disorders uh, undergoing rehabilitation and training. So we designed an entire setup, entire training uh, for kids to be able to interact with the robot, um, pass objects, uh, do joint tasks with the robot, but in a safe way, so that's why you see there's a screen so that nobody hurts each other. Um, and this is how the training looks. There's always a therapist together with a robot, and the kid plays with the robot, but in the, in the games that they're playing, we embed training of social skills. In this case, they are training uh, either joint attention or visual spatial perspective taking. This is a mechanism of cogni um, cognitive mechanism, the ability to understand that your perspective is different than mine. Mine left is your right. And this is an ability that uh, children with autism very often de either develop much later than neurotypical kids or they don't develop this ability. And this is underlying very many other social cognitive mechanisms or social interactions. So if we manage to, uh, to train this kind of mechanism, maybe that will have a ripple effect for other social mechanisms and social interactions overall. So let me just show you very quickly how, how the training looks. Uh, the kid has a cube, passes to the robot, and needs to tell what does the robot see. They need to understand that the robot sees different side of the cube than the kid. Um, so we have extremely promising results after um, a year of training of, of kids with autism, and we show that actually ICAP-assisted training uh, improves general cognitive skills of kids uh, more than standard therapy and also specifically social cognitive skills. And here I would like to highlight that the way we're testing those skills is with another human. So after the training, we test whether kids actually are able to use those skills in social interaction with another human. So they transfer the training from human robot to human human. And this is extremely promising, I, I think, and we hope that we can help kids uh, with their social skills with a robot. All right, I would just like to conclude here uh, with these few uh, concluding points. Humans do sometimes adopt intentional stance towards robots. Uh, this might vary across people, and what we have seen is that kind of bonding scenarios um, enhances um, attribution of mental states towards robots. Um, robots' signals and behavior can be perceived as social. Remember the mutual gaze experiment. And then finally, social robots can be very useful for healthcare applications. Uh, I would like to thank my team at IIT, thank the uh, funding agency, European Research Council, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Agnieszka. I'm sure... So I'm sure that uh, there are many questions for you, but we will ask them at the end. And now I'd like to introduce a new science who comes from the Institute of Social Sciences of the Lausanne University, Daniela Scarti. She's not a neuroscientist, but an anthropologist, and for the last 25 years has studied anthropologically those who study robotics, and especially there is a very interesting aspect. She has worked in uh, Kevin Warwick's lab. He was the first person who implanted a neurochip in his uh, nervous system. And uh, this is exactly what uh, Daniela uh, deals with. She works with cyborgs. How do our emotions change, uh, our feelings change uh, when we use microchips or uh, arrays and prosthetics to increase uh, our cognitive abilities? Many thanks to uh, Daniela. You will speak Italian. She is uh, not uh, um, Italian. Her mother tongue is not I Italian, she's a French, but today she honors us uh, by presenting her speech in Italian. Well, thank you very much. This is a challenge for me to speak Italian in front uh, uh, of such an audience. And so if I will be missing any words, uh, please help me out. My second challenge is 
that as the Vidyana introduced is that I come from the world of social sciences. And this is my second uh, challenge. I'm like an alien here in this uh, group. Uh, and I say the alien. And yesterday when I said that, they understood the hyena and not the alien. So this uh, is uh, the first thing I would like to point out. So the uh, title of my uh, speech uh, is uh, Amongst Robots and Cyborgs. They cannot be considered independent uh, one from the other. They're the same side of the same coin. So as a person, uh, I am very well integrated in society. I use um, all of the uh, available technologies, but as an anthropologist, I made this choice. And so uh, a step backwards vis-a-vis -vis these uh, uh, widespread uh, technologies and wonder their importance for human beings. Uh, so my, the values I'm interrogating are the values of my society. And uh, I try and uh, see how they are uh, expressed in lab researches, in sorry, research labs and in advertising. Uh, where these uh, technologies uh, are uh, uh, sold, uh, so to say. So now let me invite you to go uh, very far back in time. And this uh, uh, step back in time allowed me to understand, and this is how I see it. Uh, so understand that we are a society that is not able to consider the human being independently from technology. So paleontology that uh, tells us uh, the origin of uh, human beings sets a limit. There is no human being before a technical uh, tool. So as uh, uh, for us human beings, uh, technology is natural. This uh, uh, takes us through an explicative uh, scheme in terms of evolution as you see on screen. And so the uh, idea that uh, technology is natural has uh, the outcome that we consider it natural to use uh, these uh, technologies. We just wonder what the next step forwards will be, the progress will be, because it's natural. Or sometimes we have uh, ethical, moral questions uh, that concentrate on uh, uh, unethical use. Instead, an anthropologist uh, studies uh, the correct uses of technology and wonders uh, where the society is uh, collectively uh, directed without uh, uh, considering uh, the destination of this uh, pathway. And this means uh, that uh, uh, normally, uh, we uh, question technology uh, downstream. I instead consider these questions upstream. So how to uh, design the society that we are developing and what is the project of humanity that we are developing when using all of these technologies. 20 years ago, a very clear discourse was started, and this is why I speak of the magic thought. So we started pondering uh, on technology as uh, the solution of all the problems. Uh, we will save the world thanks to technology. And so I took this quote. In, uh, from an American paper written by the uh, um, uh, National Science uh, uh, Foundation that decides uh, which research uh, can be supported with grants. In 2002, they said that in the long run, the development of intelligent machines could lead to a golden age of prosperity, not only in the industrialized nations, but throughout the world. So you can read it 
in English. Don't ask me to translate it into Italian. So this goes back to the magical thought. So if there is a problem, there is a technological solution to solve the problem. In those times, you really think of a, a thought? Yes, yes, it's a thought. Thank you for your support. Yes, it's a, it's a thought. So this happened uh, in 2005. There was the World Sum Summit on Information Society that developed that hope of uh, solving everything with uh, technology. Well, now, uh, focusing on uh, robots and cyborgs, if we consider this uh, from the human point of view and society point of view, we can see that we have delegated activities to some machines. And the first thing that we have delegated is physical strength. And, uh, you know, the assembly line, uh, uh, there is also the so-called smart uh, vacuum cleaner. So the engineer uh, sells uh, the smart uh, independent uh, vacuum cleaner. And technologically speaking, that uh, vacuum cleaner has an IA. But I am a human being, and I just consider it a vacuum cleaner. I do not consider it an intelligent uh, vacuum cleaner. I do not uh, expect uh, the activity. So after that, uh, uh, delegate, after delegating the physical strength, uh, there is also the delegation of decision, and this is a trainer that is self-driven, as in Lausanne. The third uh, stage of this uh, uh, delegation of this proxy, so activities, uh, when these activities are carried out by human beings, uh, well, they need uh, social skills, uh, i.e. empathy, i.e emotions. I took the example of the Zora software that in inverted commas works has been working in uh, homes, uh, in elderly homes in uh, uh, Switzerland. And Zora tells us many, many things. We could really focus uh, half an hour on this uh, um, robot to emphasize its uh, tasks, but very rapidly. We know that, uh, even if it's in French, uh, I wanted to show you the screenshot, uh, which is no longer in line. Uh, the company selling it is no uh, longer uh, selling it with uh, this uh, ad uh, advertising, but you can still find it in the archives of the company. I was looking for an Italian version but, or English, but I could not find it. Anyhow, the question is, and they also get the, quest the, quest the answer to the question. So the question is, why is Zora the perfect solution? Well, this immediately uh, takes us back uh, to the magical thought uh, that I spoke of initially. Nobody speaks about uh, the problem. We can imagine uh, the problem, but it offers the solution because this is a social assistant. Zora is a social assistant. There is a lack in staff. The problem is not expressed. It's just uh, expressed uh, as a, a solution. So technology as a solution. And the second thing that uh, we're told about Zora is uh, that uh, Zora is a software that completes uh, the French robot now. And this is an important item uh, uh, now uh, ends with uh, uh, U. And uh, like in Italy, a name that finishes with an O is a male when uh, now becomes a social worker, it becomes a female. It becomes a Zora with an A at the end. And this uh, tells us something about the representation system of Zora's creators. Uh, they continue to associate all of the tasks and jobs that have to deal with care, health care of kids, children, and the elderly are females. And so Zora becomes a female and now is a male. 
a robot male. And another aspect that we uh, are uh, informed about, uh, it is a playful, uh, gentle, uh, joyous uh, patient. Just uh, let's focus on uh, patient and gentle. These are the qualities we expect uh, from a human being who is taking care of other human beings. I don't know how the situation is in Italy. I do not consider it quite different from uh, Switzerland. In uh, Switzerland, nurses, female nurses, who uh, go to the uh, domicile of patients uh, to uh, do blood tests. Uh, I uh, only have uh, X minutes just to do the blood test and not to have a social exchange with the person. And this is a paradox, socially speaking, which means that the, so the person does the technological aspect of the job and then we are sold a robot to do the social part of the job of the social worker. So it's obvious to me and I believe it's obvious to everybody Zora does not feel emotions, she's not kind, Zora is not patient, Zora does not feel emotions, but the feeling in, of that lady in the picture uh, has emotion when Zora is in front of her. So there is an inter-exchangeability, is that correct in Italian? Yes. The uh, Zora will become inter-exchangeable, both as a machine, as a human being. As Viviana said earlier, in Japan, I took this snapshot in 2019, I went to uh, meet uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro, a famous uh, uh, um, uh, expert in robotics and this robot is not in his lab it is in a museum why is the museum in the uh, the robot in the museum so as to train the robot to inter uh, exchangeability and so he talked to me about this robot uh, saying uh, very often, uh, this is human, this is a human aspect, so he kept uh, focusing on this term, human. Uh, can I talk to her? And I spoke of the robot as a she. And I asked uh, uh, the robot, are you a robot? And she replied, no, I'm human. So this, you know, mm -mm, let's think about that. So going back to uh, software Zora, well, I can see that the time uh, uh, runs faster here in Milan rather than in other uh, places. Anyhow, I see two possibilities starting from a robot like Zora. Either Zora will never be able to feel emotions, and in this case, it means that uh, us, uh, as a society, we are ready to accept social partners uh, taking care of us, uh, that uh, do not feel any emotion. So from there to thinking that all in all emotions are not uh, necessary, well, it's just a step away. So please, let's study this aspect. So now, very, very rapidly, this uh, takes us uh, on to the other uh, facet uh, of the coin. This inter-exchangeability is not carried out uh, with uh, the uh, same uh, uh, fairly, equitably. Uh, we always think that the machine uh, performs better and that the human has become the weakest link. In the same uh, uh, paper in 2002, uh, there has uh, been uh, this uh, uh, claim. The human being has uh, become the weakest link, both uh, physiologically and cognitively. So when they uh, publish this claim, we will support grants in the next 20 years uh, to uh, support uh, the uh, cognitive aspect and emotional aspect of uh, human beings. Uh, 
in the past we supported machines, now we are supporting um, human beings. So cyborgs, uh, cyborgs entered uh, the world in science fiction and then in 1960 cyborgs were invented when NASA started uh, wondering how to modify human beings to send them out in space. And the first uh, person who uh, defined himself uh, as the first uh, cyborg is uh, Kevin Warwick, uh, and I have worked in his lab. And uh, cyborg is uh, the two words, uh, uh, cybernetics and organism. And so we have the definition of uh, cybernetics uh, as uh, defined by Norbert uh, Wiener. And uh, uh, this uh, is uh, the uh, science, uh, uh, the definition uh, that uh, Wiener uh, gave uh, you, intelligent uh, uh, human beings uh, are the organization between atoms of matter. And in my opinion, we are all thinking in a cybernetic manner. He defined cybernetic as the science of control and communications in the animal and machine. And so with Zora, uh, we are not at that level, nor uh, the uh, idea of substituting a shoulder with an artificial shoulder with a prosthetics, because we have uh, this cybernetic uh, thought. Let me leave the slide, I do not have uh, time. And so what I want to say here, on the left, you have a photograph of uh, Kevin Warwick when he, he did uh, that uh, experiment with uh, the um, uh, array implanted into his arm. So he is in America and uh, the signal arrives uh, uh, via internet uh, in London. He moves uh, the arm. Uh, he says that human beings uh, are obsolete. On uh, the right hand side, I put a prosthetic uh, arm. What he is doing there is uh, something useful. He is using the prosthetic. But uh, Warwick uh, is not interested in that. He said uh, that human beings uh, need uh, to uh, be fused uh, with technology if uh, human beings are to survive. And he also claims that uh, the body is useless. Uh, and moreover, it is a hurdle, an obstacle. And with the example of uh, internet, what he wanted to show is that he was able to control the whole uh, technological environment directly via his brain. And uh, he also did an experiment with his wife. You can see a necklace there. He said uh, that uh, he uh, shared uh, the emotions with his wife and in fact what happened was the necklace changed color according to the heart rate of Warwick. This does not mean that he shared the emotion with hair. He shared with her something that still had to be translated to her so as for her to understand the emotion he was feeling. And uh, all this to speak of uh, Teseo's boat. The myth says uh, that uh, Teseo's uh, boat uh, replaced uh, all of the wood and planks one after the other. And the philosophical question is, uh, is it the same boat after the replacement uh, has occurred? And so let's ask the same question for human beings. So not only from the philosophical point of view of identity, but uh, from the human being's perspective. A human being where everything has been replaced, including the brain with all of its uh, functions, uh, including emotions, is this still a human being? And this uh, poses the question of the limit between man and machine. So if our Zora 
by sharing and feeling emotions becomes like a human being, what is the difference between a cyborg and a human being then? So all of these questions have to be asked today. We have to wonder about it because uh, tomorrow is going to be too late uh, to tackle this aspect. Thank you. Very well. Thank you very much. We've had uh, three outstanding speakers uh, and uh, there will be uh, other three uh, great uh, speakers after the coffee break. So we're running late, so very rapidly uh, have your coffee break and then come here to experience uh, this uh, uh, musical performance. So uh, a machine that transforms the uh, sounds of, of, uh, that are played into images. Then we will have Barbara Mazzolai who speaks of uh, animal emotions, uh, Mavi Sanchez Vives who speaks uh, of embodiment, uh, how the brain can be deceived and be transplanted in another person, and finally Sara Tonelli who deals uh, with AI and how emotions are captured in the uh, World Wide Web. So have a nice uh, coffee break and see you in a while.
Thank you. 
Buongiorno, stiamo per riprendere, vi invitiamo ad accomodarvi. Grazie. Welcome back, please take your seats. We are going to restart the event. Thank you. Allora, ciao a tutti. Welcome back everybody. I'd really like to start uh, given that we are running uh, late and uh, I would also like to uh, leave some time for some questions at the end of uh, the uh, morning. So I'm very, very happy now to introduce an, an outstanding performance. Uh, it has been specifically designed and studied for this event. In our meetings, uh, we always have an artistic moment. I am convinced, uh, in fact, we're speaking of emotion so we don't only need uh, uh, scientists uh, to speak to us, uh, but we also need uh, uh, emotions uh, that have uh, to be sparked uh, within uh, each one of us. Uh, even if our speakers have been really great and have been uh, uh, so good in uh, provoking our emotions as well. So now. We are going uh, to invite Sebastiano Cognolato. He is a composer and he also works uh, in uh, the uh, technological environment. So uh, his composition will be performed by a piano player, Eri Hamakawa. She has uh, been playing since uh, she was five. She studies with uh, Ani Hunoda and Mr. Finazzi at the Conservatorio in Milan. And she has been awarded numerous accolades in Moncalieri and uh, the Città di Spoleto Award and held concerts in Italy and Japan. She is a very talented musician who has uh, accepted to uh, come here and play for this scientific and uh, emotional uh, experiment. Uh, then uh, I'm going to leave the floor to Orf Quarenghi. He's an uh, artist and devotes attention to uh, all the technological aspects in creativity. So creative writing, creative music composition, and he has this project, Flipper, and there is like a clash, a collision between video art and other uh, artistic uh, expressions uh, and has created an interactive performance where the emotions of those uh, listening to the uh, music are captured by a magnetic uh, uh, headset or cap and uh, create a flow of colorful images that uh, um, will be uh, projected on screen. Come here, Sebastiano, so you can introduce uh, this uh, performance. Uh, Sebastiano is a young talent. I adore his music. He's a great composer. You don't have a microphone, Sebastiano. It's coming. Yes, the microphone is coming. Good morning, everybody. Very short presentation of this performance. What is going to occur is uh, that uh, there are uh, six uh, parts of a, a collection I have composed called uh, uh, Butterflies. And Orquarenghi has elaborated his project uh, of interaction between music and human brain via the machine with the butterflies that you will see on the screen. How will all this uh, play out? We have two pairs uh, of uh, um, voluntaries. 
the first pair in the first uh, pair, the first uh, lady is wearing the special cap or headset that is able to capture these signals. And on screen, we will say, we will see, sorry, uh, a game of butterflies whilst uh, she listens uh, to the music. Uh, these butterflies will uh, uh, fly on screen according to uh, her neuronal activation. The um, track is uh, one minute long and then uh, afterwards the second lady would do something uh, with uh, another technique, uh, the same uh, concept uh, but uh, with the canonica concept. We will uh, evoke her neuronal uh, activation for a minute. And then the third piece uh, is listened by both participants of the, the pair and uh, simultaneously they will uh, listen uh, to the uh, music and there will be the uh, uh, mutual uh, neuronal activation. So if our piano player is ready, a big round of applause for her, Eri Hamakawa. And please, uh, in the audience, be careful and see and note whether there are differences uh, between the first and the second uh, lady in terms of perception. So let uh, us invite uh, Costanza. And let's uh, start the uh, musical performance. Carla, prego. Now we have Carla.
Adesso richiamiamo... Ecco, mentre arrivano le So we have two more volunteers now. Interaction between two different brains. It produces, um, you know, a sort of, let me think. It's difficult to describe. I mean, something which is really, really stronger. I mean, you can see the interactions and all of the emotions, you know, traveling. Uh, this is, was very interesting, in my opinion. I mean, there was a difference between the first and the second one. The second volunteer had closed eyes. And, um, you know, in that case, I mean, all of the uh, colors were stronger, brighter, including images. So once again, she was, let's say, listening to her emotions. Maybe her brain was in alpha state. Let's start with Anna. Bene. Cristina.
mettere la tua testa. <laughs> ok, emotions in your head. Now we can see together. Let me check. Thank you. That was so beautiful. You know, their looks together, their gaze. I, I, I was just thinking of Alexander Dianesta's speech. I mean, the uh, gaze, the look that creates connections. Maria Grazia, can we come back in the future? So it would be great to really understand how, uh, you know, images are created. So, uh, okay. Today we don't have time, but you will be invited. Let me invite now Barbara Mazzolai. Barbara has been uh, a guest here in the past. I really like what she does. Barbara takes care of plantoid robots, octopus robots. Okay, octopus once again. And of course, um, uh, they have different types of intelligence and uh, emotions. Now, uh, she directs a bio-inspired soft robotics center in Genoa. So she's been uh, managing the iWord project funded by the European Research Council, aiming at the development of intelligent robots to monitor the health of the underground. She's a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, She's also a member of the Advisory Committee, Autonomous Material Systems, University of Freiburg. She's been a visiting faculty at Imperial College in London. RoboHub is the number one international scientific and robotic community. She's uh, one of the top 25 women in the industry. She got the Marisa Berisari Award, or the medal from the Italian Senate. Last but not least, she's just published a book with Longanese, The Genes Nature and the Future Told by Plants. What she does is really interesting. And uh, okay, so I'm really discovering something new. Thank you, thank you so much Viviana. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here today, and uh, it's also a great opportunity to share with you some of the activities that we are developing in our lab in making 
non-human, um, you know, uh, well, forms of intelligence. So we work on bio-inspired robotics. I mean, we take inspiration from nature, and then we take into account the uh, different skills or capacities, I mean, from human beings or even living beings um, to adapt to changing situations. So then we use these principles to create new robots at the service of mankind. So before taking a deeper dive into this beautiful world, showing you the applications we have for these robots, um, well, I have a question for you, uh, which is usually a question, you know, uh, I have for myself. Uh, um, would you like to be an oak or a lion in your second life? Now, because you are forced that to make a choice, well, I think lion, right? Because, you know, the lion is the symbol of passion, force, strength, courage. Um, how many books have been written on lions? Um, uh, we have plenty, you know, of sayings on lions. Uh, William Shakespeare said, well, a lion, of course, uh, uh, can have a specific expression, but once again, you know, there are many other smaller animals around, so they are the kings of the kingdom of animals. Well, you know, personally, I would say oak, because plants give us much more than strength and courage. Plants give us life. No plants, no life on Earth. And, uh, well, of course, I'm talking about planet Earth. So uh, they have colonized um, um, the mainland uh, more than 450 million years ago. Homo sapiens appeared on Earth around 200,000 years ago only. So you understand that they have had a long time to adapt themselves and to express different forms of adaptation. So let's uh, um, make a sort of a comparison between animals and plants. Well, you can see that they are different now. Plants have a modular organization. I mean, plants' structures are redundant, so they are sort of repetitive. This is fundamental because they are much more robust and more resilient. They really colonize extreme environments. I think that the, uh, well, even more interesting point of view, I mean, from our own perspective, and by the way, this is what we try to mimic, plants grow for their entire life. So, and they do this uh, in the extreme parts of their body, so roots, uh, but also the canopy. And they add cells, so the totally potent cells, so or stem cells. So they split and differentiate. So, also a tree, uh, you know, a 1,000-year-old uh, or 2,000-year-old tree is basically always young, right? So, they keep growing and um, they adapt their body and morphology to the uh, environment. So they're very plastic, so to say, high level of plasticity. They shape their body based on the, uh, well, stimuli they got from the, uh, from the world. So all of this, well, this is what we are implementing in our robots. Uh, movement, perception, uh, distributed control, um, energy efficiency, and uh, networking. Now, uh, let's uh, um, see what happens today and what happened in the past in terms of perception of plants. Uh, we think plants are passive organisms, so they are not able to move or to perceive the uh, environment around them. Well, this perception or this sort of cliché, if you will, well, this is deeply rooted, once again back to roots, um, so this is deeply rooted in, you know, antique times. I mean, this is Aristotle uh, in the De Anima. So he describes plants and he says there's a vegetative soil. Plants don't move, so they don't need the sensory skills. But this is what animals have. And at the same time, intellectual capacities or skills when talking about human beings. Well, uh, let's let's take again a deep dive in history. There are so many cliché or commonplaces in terms of plants. Uh, there are plenty of them in books. I'd like to talk about this example. Now, this is John Ellis. Now, John Ellis uh, uh, is a person, you know, with a great passion for plants and carnivorous plants. So, this is the uh, T. Neomocipola. This is a carnivorous plant that you know very well. So, it closes its leaves when there's a potential prey touching at least uh, two of these little stings inside the leaf. 
and uh, the distance between 1 and 2 is 30 seconds. This is a built-in control. This is really built into the plant, so this means that the prey stays within the two leaves. And uh, this is really important for these plants. You know, these plants live uh, in environments with almost no nitrogen, so they take nitrogen from animals. Let me now go back to John Ellis. Now, John Ellis describes this phenomenon, so this plant's closing or trapping leaves. Now, uh, he couldn't measure, but this is just uh, uh, less than one second. This is due to Linnaeus, um, a great scientist, and then he classified uh, uh, well, living beings still in use. This is the perfect rat trap. But Linnaeus responds uh, in a very, well, kind of lukewarm way. The idea of an insect eating plant is ridiculous. Now, this is contrary to the rules of nature given to us by God. So it sort of switches off all of these, you know, scientific studies where the plant is not just a source of food or ornament for our homes, but this is something more. It's uh, an individual or an organism. Now, Charles Darwin wrote beautiful books on uh, plants, on movements, intelligence, uh, and then on many different types of plants. Now, mm, well, many years ago, he sort of wrote to the followers of Linnaeus. So he wrote this book, and uh, he talks about insectivorous plants, uh, which is a little, I mean, weaker. But anyway, this book will be a very successful one. So what are the reasons uh, behind this? Uh, well, you know, I've studied plants for many different reasons, but also artificial systems. Well, I think that one of the key problems is the lack of perception of movements uh, made by plants. Either they are too slow for us, so we have to speed them up, or they are too quick and we have to slow them down. So this is a lack of perception of what a plant can do in its environment. Uh, and we think they are inferior beings. So this is why we have this commonplaces and prejudices. This is something I had to face uh, when, for the first time in the world, uh, I offered plants uh, as a robotic model to create uh, independent robots uh, uh, getting into, uh, I mean, underground for soil monitoring in terms of agriculture, farming and pollution. At my third attempt, I got this European fund opening a brand new line of research on plant-inspired robotics. Well, actually, plants do move. They do this all the time. And basically, they do this when they grow. So they adapt their body. Now, this is not a random growth. They do perceive the environment around them. They have a distributed control right into the roots. So sensory skills or capacities. So they grow away from environmental stimulus. And once again, they do networks. This means they exchange information. I will tell you how in a minute. They will do this thanks to major symbiotic actions with other organisms. Now, this is our model. We started from the roots. I mean, there are many organisms, you know, living uh, underground. Roots are the best adapted plants to live in this, this environment, which is an extreme one. You have uh, plenty of friction, plenty of pressure. Um, if you don't necessarily have to go too deep, but this is fundamental for the quality of all ecosystems. In the soil, you find plenty of biodiversity. So how do they move? Where well, they grow from the tip, so there's a cellular split, they absorb water, they push the tip into the soil, uh, but the tip only, so they reduce friction. Uh, once again, they also have perceptive capacities, humidity, and then they avoid obstacles or chemical substances and so on and so forth, and they create um, networks. You can see here one of the robots that we made. We have translated them I in this concept, I mean movement in growth in a robot which is able to grow. So we add new artificial material. We have miniaturized the uh, 3D printer in the head of the robot. There's a sort of, uh, well, this is a motor pulling a filament, I mean a thread made of thermoplastics. This material, when heated, is sort of sticky. And then layer after layer, the robot creates its body. The direction of the growth is given by the sensors and by the tropisms, which are the, uh, once again, plant-inspired, the root-inspired mechanisms. So the robot, let's say, shies away from an environmental stimulus. 
You can also see passive features when it comes to adapting to an environment. The road adapts its body to the environment around it. We have exploited the features of the material, so if it's not very uh, solid, the body adapts to the environment. The plant does much more than this because um, in case of gradient, uh, curbs or, you know, are required. So uh, there will be more cells on the one side, so it's a differential growth. We have implemented the same behavior in the robo by controlling the speeds, you know, uh, the growth speeds and also the layering. Here you have another organism. This is once again a worm. So the, uh, um, this is a worm we are studying to create soft robots for soil exploration purposes. This is interesting, just observe the root and the worm, I mean, moving into the soil, you can see that the adaptation strategies look quite similar. I mean, even if this worm, of course, it has liquid inside the muscles, but it just moves to the first segments in the soil by contracting muscles selectively, pushing the head and then retracting the body. So this is how it uh, manages, I mean, the pressure or friction problem. And, uh, well, the same movement is performed by the root, so the environment we live in has a major impact on our adaptation skills, also in terms of behavior and morphology. Now, intelligence, well, we can say intelligence, we can also uh, call it or define it distributed control, so the fact of adapting to an ever-changing environment, solving complex problems, that this is what plants have been doing for so long. It perceives the plenty of stimuli at the same time making decisions on how to grow and where to grow. Priorities are given to some key factors. The priority is dynamic, so we have implemented the same dynamic balance in our robots. What can we do with these robots? Well, we can explore the soil so we can go underground for farming purposes. This is a um, project from Tuscany. We had to monitor temperature and humidity uh, in the soil, but depending on the sensors, we can also measure other parameters, for example, pollutants in the soil. So this is another interesting point. We use robotics also to better understand biology. And in my opinion, this is one of the challenges of the future. Now, in this very case, we carried out a comparative analysis between two identical systems. One is pushed, I mean, from upwards. The other one grows from the tip. We saw that in the latter, um, well, the system is much quicker and uh, it doesn't use the same quantity of energy. So the robo, of course, uh, well, is not the root, but we used a tool moving in the same, uh, you know, well, underground. So this is the future. So the robot will validate ideas or hypotheses in science or biology. So we do this. We create the robots growing uh, underground. This is another European uh, project. So this is a completely different world. Look at these plants. I mean, they climb up, right? So in this case, the robot has to go against the, the uh, well, against gravity. So uh, there are plenty of solutions that they, you know we are implementing. I mean, the inspiration is exactly climbing plants because they don't have a sophisticated trunk. So to say some, they use I mean most of the energy to grow much quickly, um, much more quickly versus towards the light. But of course uh, they have to create a sort of thorns or sort of sticking systems. I mean, this is vine. Um, we also want to understand how they manage to get a support without using a uh, site. So, uh, in many climbing plants that live uh, in uh, environments with plenty of other trees, when they are very small, there's no light from the sky. So they perceive shadow at the very beginning. So they perceive the presence of other plants. They move to other plants, so they grow all around the trunk then uh, all the way up, but when they see the light, uh, they turn into phototropic systems. So we would like to implement the same behavior also in our robots. They can explore the world with no cameras, with no webcams, as we say today, with no sight. Okay, once again, distributed control or intelligence implants, but what about animals?
Now here we have an incredible model, uh, so it's a great animal. We've been studying for years, octopus. You know, it's a mollusk, it's a cephalopodes. It has no stiff uh, uh, structures, no skeleton, so it can contract um, its body and then go through small holes with eight arms, so they can be, you know, bent or extended in every direction. It depends on how muscles are organized. Uh, it can become very long. I mean, this arm can become 70% longer than the uh, length at rest. Co-contracting muscles, it becomes very rigid or strong. Um, we are interested into the distributed control of the octopus. Most neurons of the octopus are contained in the eight arms. Even if there's a high sophisticated brain, if you count the number of neurons, it's very similar to the number of neurons a dog has. Why is it so important to have distributed control? Well, biology doesn't tell us, but possibly, and because of the complexity of the body, with so much freedom and the freedom of movement, once again, arms can reach uh, out. It's really difficult to control. So distributed control does help. These are some studies from neuroscientists that have studied octopus with us. So when the um, arm is sort of launched out, this is the reaching movement. You can see that one part is controlled by the brain, but all of the, let's say, the reach out, if you will, the stiffness is controlled periphery, from the periphery. Okay, so roles are distributed. There's another thing we saw. We have created a um, silicon cone, same density, and then with some um, seawater. We have accelerated with our wrist. Look at the movement of this arm, which is uncontrolled. This is very similar to the movement of the natural arm. This means that interaction with the environment is so important. We don't control everything. It would take up too much energy, so we trust the environment to do this. Uh, in terms of octopus suckers, they are also very interesting because they stick to every surface. So let me go back to biology. If you want to create an artificial sucker, we need to study the natural one. We discovered, uh, uh, well, unprecedented anatomical structures. Can you see this uh, protrusion in the center of the sucker? Well, this means that it can really stick or, you know, come off. Never described before. We also have found hierarchical uh, hairs. Uh, we don't know exactly what they are for. Probably chemo-recepting sensors. So they perceive the environment, but this is not for sure. We have used all of this info to have an artificial model of the sucker with materials that have similar mechanical, I mean, mechanical properties similar to natural ones, especially working in the water, so adhering to any surface. This is an example of one of industrial projects. The challenge here was to have a robo moving in a constrained environment uh, uh, with a high pressure, uh, with some dirt and oil. This is a new paradigm. This is the body of the robo adapting to the object that has to be retrieved thanks to the use of suckers. Uh, once again, we change the perspective here and the way they interact. Let me go back to plants. There's something more we are studying right now, and it sounds like philosophy. You know, the plant goes over itself, beyond itself. It creates networks, as I said before, fundamental networks for its survival. So it perceives itself. Uh, well, the key word here is symbiosis. So roots, since they colonized, you know, uh, Earth, they started a symbiosis with um, mushrooms. Now, in this case, the mushrooms are just like us, so they cannot create organic substance from an inorganic substance. So the plant gives sugar to the mushroom, but then the mushroom gives uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and water back because uh, they have extensions reaching out to where roots don't reach. So there's an exchange. Quite recently, um, and by the way, these are very recent studies, I mean, just started. So basically, plants communicate thanks to this underground network, which is a put by web, 
World Wide Web again. If a plant is attacked by a parasite or a pathogen, it communicates to other plants kilometers away. If they can, they have to adapt the protection systems. There's another recent discovery we are also working on. These networks are important reservoirs of CO2. They fixate the CO2, and uh, this is fundamental. Well, you know that this is one of the GHG, so the greenhouse gases. So they increase the temperature on the surface of the Earth. Well, the most efficient ones are exactly those you find in cold climates. This means that if temperature, you know, becomes higher, well, it would attack the symbiosis, which are so useful for us. So we would like to have robots that, in our opinion, can help us better understand how the underground network works. We are now creating virtual networks. So we study the connections between the fungal systems and the plants together with a new plantoid version, releasing substances to uh, kick off the onset of symbiosis underground. To wrap off, uh, let me talk about my dream. Well, we are working on this dream to uh, hopefully it will come true. I'd like to have robots uh, really being integrated into ecosystems. Okay, so we start from nature and we would like to go back to nature. So we're going to use the robots for exploration purposes or for the farming industry, but then they disappear because they are recyclable or biodegradable. So. All of this is possible thanks to all of my colleagues. So we have people here from the four corners of the world, different backgrounds, an interdisciplinary group. Thank you so much for this. I also would like to thank funders, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Every time I uh, listen to Barbara, well, I think that uh, you know, plants are smarter than us and that they have had a long time to adapt to evolution, so uh, we will become plants. So we will have intelligence in different parts of the body. We haven't talked about emotions, but you know the plants love music. They respond to love of people, you know, so the so-called green thumb. Okay then, now I have another exceptional speaker. Uh, Mavi Sanchez, uh, Vives. Mavi comes from Barcelona. Mavi was associate professor at the medical school and um, her postdoc training was done at the Rockefeller University and Yale. She has a very long uh, resume or bio. She was a principal investigator in 10 different European projects. Today she's uh, leading this scientific work in the Human Brain Project. The name is Network Underlying Cognition and Consciousness. It has 40 different groups working on this. And Mavi takes care of nervous structures of consciousness and cognition. She will be talking about virtual reality, VR, for embodiment, which is sort of a trick. So the brain thinks that he is another person. Now this embodiment uh, as a technique is used today for many different therapeutical targets. Anyway, Marvi will tell us more. Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, after presentations and questions, uh, you can also take a tour of the Mead building led by Maria Grazia Mattei. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be this morning here in this conference uh, in memory of Rita Levi Montalcini. I really would like to thank those who convened this meeting, especially Viviana. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, a new approach to emotions, virtual embodiment. So I will start by telling you what's, to be, what's been in a virtual world. So, uh, virtual reality, it's a digital reality that is uh, in which we can inhabit. It can uh, surround us completely. It's very different, therefore, from a normal screen. Um, it, um, it, we have, when we are in it, we have a stereoscopic vision. It tracks our limbs. It can display in different uh, sensory systems. As we will see now, 
and it determines the, what we see depending on our head position. Therefore, objects are three-dimensional. So it's, it's uh, very different. This is an image from the Matrix which brought to the uh, imagination of many people what it was to live completely in, uh, in a virtual environment while the bodies were uh, connected to this world through their brain activity. So therefore, it's all created by a computer, and this brings, uh, opens very interesting questions about uh, what is this, the, the reality, what is reality made of, how much of we perceive is actually there, how much is actually generated by our own brain, or even how much is there that we don't even know about like infrared or ultrasound because we don't have transducers for that. So therefore, virtual reality makes us think about the reality, the nature of reality and also of consciousness. So, for example, in this image you can see how we can feel the wind, but maybe someone is tricking us and delivering this wind from the outside. Uh, also, we can measure how much is created or fill up, as we say, fill in by our own brain. For example, this image is of an experience in a library some 20 years ago, a virtual library, where people just navigated and afterwards they reported often sounds, even when it was a silent environment, because the brain filled in this auditory information that was expected to be there. So therefore, it can also be a very interesting tool in neuroscience. So we are in this environment uh, where our reality, uh, all the visual, the auditory, tactile, olfactory, our own proprioception, even the feeling of pain, the, I mean, the delivery of pain or temperature can be delivered, can be created by a computer and we can be by, uh, in this uh, virtual, completely virtual reality. So a, a very interesting aspect to it is that we respond to it as if it were real. And this is very well known. So you may think, well, I, I know it's not there, right? But however, this image that you have here is the pits room where uh, people were asked to do a task. As you can see, there is a hole in the middle. They were asked to do a task going on to this, uh, picking up a box from that chair. And uh, very carefully, people that didn't have fear of heights, everybody, even when it, they knew it was not real, they walked very carefully around the border. Uh, this was even enhanced when there was some tactile correlation where they felt this border in their feet. So if there was another sensation, not only visual, but also tactile, they even they would, they, they would do this uh, more. So we respond to it as if it were real, and we call this to be present in virtual environments. So for example, I filmed this in a commercial center. These kids, they know they, they are in a commercial center, they put this head-mounted display, but they are responding to it as if it were real. So because uh, because we respond to it as if it were real, a virtual reality is been, uh, is, has been used in therapy and is, has been used to transform emotions, uh, which is the topic. So, for example, these are some images from the use uh, to treat a post-traumatic stress disorder by exposure therapy. So people can recreate this space, go into it, and then learn to modulate their anxiety, their stress, and this has been used also, for example, for fear of flying, because going into this virtual representation of a place that one is, is scared of, of this situation, there is what is called a place illusion, and one can learn to control this fear of flying or fear of heights. This is from an experiment where we did that people would go up in an elevator and uh, we studied well in this case how music can also help with this response to it. So these are all examples that we can respond to places, right? Uh, as if they were real, but we can also respond uh, to people. So uh, many people have fear of uh, speaking, and uh, if I would ask you, how would you feel if you would uh, speak in front of these very cartoonish avatars? You would say, well, you know, this is a joke. It's, they are very simple. However, even, uh, I mean, uh, experienced speakers participated in an experiment, and they had to give a talk to this positive audience that they pay attention, they lean forwards, they even clap you in the, in the middle of your speech, versus this negative audience that they, they yawn, they cut, they, they put their feet on the table, they walk away in the middle of your talk, and, and even when they are cartoonish, 
um, they, they found it very difficult to uh, speak to this kind of audience. So therefore, there is a reaction to other avatars. Uh, there is a response to it, even if they are not very realistic. Nowadays, this is from another study ongoing. In the lab, we can make better avatars, but I can tell you that with simpler ones, one can get these responses. And this is a, a more extreme response. This is a study uh, by Daniel Freeman et al. in 2008, uh, studying how people respond with paranoid thoughts to people in a, in a, in a subway. So actually, they found that the number of the amount of paranoid thoughts that were not by paranoid people but by general population, some people created this uh, had these feelings that people had bad thoughts about this. They were criticizing them and so on with the avatar. So there is a response also to people. Okay, but how about our own body? So we have, a, we have a body, we carry it our whole life, we look down, we see this body for what we call a first person perspective, as you can see here in the image. And of course, it's a very important element of our own representation. So we, studied, we started studying some years ago to what extent we could feel that that virtual body was our own. And we work on, based on a phenomenon called the rubber hand illusion, where if one provides uh, visotactile correlations with a rubber hand, one could feel that rubber hand as part of their own, uh, of their own body. So we did this with a virtual arm, and we saw that when this stimulation is synchronous, as you can see there, uh, there was an illusion of ownership uh, of this uh, hand, virtual hand, that can be measured in different ways. And, uh, however, this illusion is not created when this stimulation is asynchronous between the visual uh, information and the tactile information. We did the same with uh, some colleagues in, in Italy uh, using a, a, a glove that could measure the movements. And in this case, we did visual motor correlations, not visual tactile, and the same phenomenon occurred. So if we have these proper correlations with the virtual body, there is a strong illusion that this is a part of your body. And it's not the case when this is asynchronous. Okay. So, we moved on from the arm after several studies to check this on the whole body, as you can see here. And here I can point out to several elements. One is the first person perspective, therefore you look down, you see your body. Uh, here there is also a reflection in the mirror. There is a correlation of movements, which is proprioception, motor, visual information. So there is a number of sensory and motor streams that are coherent to your brain and your brain cannot resist to this. It's, it, this is my body, it has to be my body. So uh, this illusion over uh, many years we have been exploring different impacts that it has, for example phys on physiological responses. We have worked on the modulation of pain how pain threshold can be modulated if we transform this body. Or, as you can see on the top, how uh, one can respond with anxiety if your virtual body is going to be harmed, you are going to move away for sure. It has some impact on cognition, the two examples that I will show you now, and also on emotions and behaviors. So, um, one possibility is to get into the shoes of another. So I told you we can feel this virtual body as our own, but it does not require to be our own representation. So people often ask me, you know, but we want to do this, but with, my, with the real avatar. And, and this can be done very well. Today, with some photographs, there can be personalized avatars. But this is not always an advantage. And, uh, and one possibility also that is very interesting to explore in virtual reality is that you can have a different body. And in fact, you can also experience situations from the perspective of someone else. And we can do that between other things, because as I said, our brain receives these different afferents and if they are coherent, it's going to assume this body that fulfills an number of rules is the body uh, of this person, but is flexible with other things. For example, the shape or the size or the color or the gender. So uh, this is from a study in our lab where 
people embody the body of a child. So there was a smaller size, obviously, but also a, a shape of a child, more roundish. This was compared against a small human. So it was separated what is the shape from what is the size. And there was a very interesting cognitive effect that some of you probably remember from, from your childhood, which is that after this experience of uh, few minutes, uh, there is a recalibration of size. So when people had to estimate size, they overestimate. So everything looks a little bit bigger. Yeah? So, so therefore, this is a cognitive effect that we can measure, which is a consequence of having a different body. Uh, there has been also several studies on changing race. So what happens if we inhabit the body, for example, of uh, someone of uh, black, Race. So um, there has been different studies. For example, the one here on the left is from a, a is, is one in our lab where people did a Tai Chi classes in a virtual environment for several days, inhabiting people of uh, of different races, and it's very consistent in our lab and also in other groups that there is a decreased racial bias. And we are talking about implicit racial bias that can be measured with a specific test, which are well known and validated implicit uh, racial bias in this case. In this case. And, uh, and then one it has an implicit change, and this is what we look for uh, with these uh, experiences, changes that are not explicit, people don't have to think about it, but they are implicit. They have this association, and then they are going to present these kind of changes. So it's a, a very good illustration also of the, uh, the plasticity of our brain to assume these different bodies, and then, uh, well, there is some uh, consequences. So I'm going to tell you in this last part how being the other can change, can change the self in a way. So this is from a recent study, also from people with our lab in collaboration with the police in the United States that were precisely interested about these, um, uh, these effects on the implicit racial bias. And this is an experience, a, a study done with the police as subjects. And, uh, and what they did was to have a, a session where there was a person who was arrested and then there was some verbal uh, discrimination um, uh, speech given to them and then they would uh, have this experience of, of being in the position of the, the receptor in this case, of the arrested person. So they could have this experience from a different perspective, and this I remind you, they were policemen. And then there was a second session also in VR where they had to show, uh, uh, there was a situation where they had to act, and they had a larger helping behavior toward people that had this kind of aggressions. So this is a, a, a typical effect when one gets some kind of uh, implicit association to a different group. And then the last part, in the last minutes, I want to tell you about a work that uh, knowing that we had this kind of tool and this potential, we started this work uh, in 2010 thinking, so how would it be if uh, people that have a violent behavior, uh, specifically in the area of domestic violence, what would it be, how would it be the effect if they could be they could feel, they could experience what is to be in the side of the victim. So, uh, well, we were, of course, um, uh, moved by the fact that there are 30% of women uh, worldwide uh, that have experienced violence by a partner, and 38% of all murders of women are committed by intimate partners. So it's, it's a, a problem that uh, takes place more or less all over the world with not so different numbers. And, uh, and then we thought of this uh, basic idea. So what happens if we pl place aggressors in this perspective? And this was uh, the approach. So the idea was to create this environment where there was a, 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 this kind of psychological, not physical abuse. There was a confrontation there. And uh, 
think this passed automatically. And then um, there was a, a, a perspective that one could take. So to do this, uh, we had actors. They acted the, ski, the, the scene. The, the script was, uh, or when we do it, is, is co-designed with experts working in this area. Arriba. And then uh, there is this session of embodiment, as I showed you before, in front of a mirror in this case, getting familiar with this new body, uh, being able to have all these sensory motor correlations. But the one doing this is a man that now is going into this uh, body of a woman and has this first person perspective that I told you about. And this is the kind of situation. So uh, there is this. Uh, a woman is there in the house and then uh, this a man enters and starts having this derogative speech offending her and, and Callate. it has uh, some response, it's a bit interactive because it can uh, uh, say shut up or it can say look at me because there is the tracking of the, of the head so if the person looks away can say hey look at me and then there is violence against an object, not against a person, and then there is an invasion of the peripersonal space. So this is uh, one of the environments. Here you see it moving because it's an actual person looking around the environment, so this is how we move our head. And I will let Hi. it play just a little bit. What are you doing? I said, what the hell are you doing? Have you seen yourself in the mirror? I mean, where do you think you're going looking like that, huh? You shut up. You could put some effort in and dress up or something. Look at me. Jeez, you look 20 years. Okay, so I'll show a little That's bit gonna more stop here. right now. Do you see that phone? Do you fucking see it? Yeah? Well, there goes the fucking phone. And you can forget about your fucking mobile as well. Okay. And then I will just play you know what? a this closer situation. My fault. This is all my fault. I've been too soft on you. Yeah. I've been too, too patient. But you know why? Because I love you. So, we, as I said, we started this in 2010, and the first thing we studied in control men with no history of violent behavior, just to make sure to see how people responded to it, whether they, they really felt the situation as credible, whether they felt they could embody the body of a woman, whether they responded, it was believable, they responded to it. So we did these uh, studies, then we moved on uh, sometime later to work with aggressors, collaborating with, with uh, groups working on rehabilitation. Later on, we started collaborating actually with the Justice Department and, and it started the integration of these uh, experiences in the rehabilitation programs and therefore with the idea that they are a, a useful tool for the therapists and nowadays it's, uh, it's begun to be integrated in the rehabilitation in prisons, especially in modules where they work with the empathy. So I will just tell you uh, a couple of words about, uh, so in, in control men, we observed that we proved, for example, that first person perspective had advantages over third person perspective. And uh, we saw that, that uh, they could embody the body of a woman, that they would respond to it, and that first person was better. And then uh, because this is about emotions, I wanted to tell you that one of the effects uh, which is uh, very interesting and we have found in offenders is that in general, um, uh, uh, people with violent behavior is being reported and we have found also consistently there is a deficit in emotion recognition. And then we measure uh, emotion recognition in a face body compound test. And uh, what we found is that uh, if we did test before and after having this kind 
of experience, uh, this, control, uh, this group of, of offenders uh, that had a deficit uh, of, uh, over, uh, uh, with respect to the controls, a deficit in the recognition of fear in the faces of, of males and females, they had a change such that after the experience there is a change in their emotion recognition. Let's say that it improves the emotion recognition. This is important because emotion recognition and emotion expression, they are very linked and is connected with the, is somehow one of the building blocks of empathy. So there is this effect that we have observed uh, very consistently. We have worked also on the brain basis in collaboration with a group of Beatrice de Gelder and there is some activation of the default mode network after the experience and this uh, appears to be related with this uh, identification of emotions. So of course there is no time now to tell you. I think it, it's an uh, illustration of the potential of this approach. We have also used for example the perspective of a child in the same uh, case of the of situation because this is also an important a piece of information, uh, also how people respond when there is this kind of violent uh, situation but they are in a third person position because it's important that people uh, somehow learn how to intervene. So there are a number of different possibilities that can be used in this direction. So just a few conclusions. Virtual wor worlds therefore can evoke real emotions and uh, for this reason they can be used in psychological therapy. It can allow having this perspective taken. And both uh, experiencing the other's person uh, perspective changes our emotion and emotion recognition in the others. And this has different applications. As you can imagine, uh, a potential being uh, reducing, and this is what we would like, uh, violent behaviors. And of course, in virtual reality, we can uh, do many things. We can say the imagination is the limit because everything is flexible, it can be changed. And we can use, for example, uh, personalized avatars, as I mentioned later. So this is from an experience where one can have their own avatar and have a conversation with themselves, which is also uh, an interesting situation that is also helpful in some situations. So finally, I would like to thank also all the collaborators along these years that have participated in different projects and the funders. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bobby. Very interesting. And I know this will have greater application as time goes by. And now our last but not least speaker, Sara Tonelli. She's a head of a group of research in digital humanities Scusa, sto parlando in inglese. Sorry, we're speaking in English. Sara Tonelli, she's a, a chief of the Bruno Kessler Trento Foundation for Research, a key action on development for technologies for kids and teenagers to contrast cyber bullying. And she's also a an expert in designing and understanding algorithms uh, so as uh, to understand uh, and capture emotions uh, in the web. We can see uh, this uh, on a daily basis, uh, fake news, uh, marketing uh, actions, uh, um, reactions to advertisement, how do we react to a political message. So I believe that your work is absolutely uh, fundamental uh, given uh, the present uh, situation and seeing what is going on today, uh, even in Ukraine. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Viviana, and for uh, our hosts uh, today. I do not deal uh, with uh, uh, virtual reality, and my uh, slides uh, are not going to be as beautifully designed uh, as the others. So I work with algorithms, uh, specifically those algorithms, algorithms that understand what we write. Well, you see, for some years now with my colleagues, so we have been working to develop and design a software which on a social network and understand what we write and understand the emotion that we are conveying. So if we read something 
uh, are you an idiot? Well, my system will say, well, this is an aggressive, offensive, negative remark. In the second one, I'm so sorry, uh, I will help you out. That's an empathetic message. And in the third one, what a great uh, show. That's a, 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 a tweet of joy and enthusiasm. As Viviana said, instead, we focus mainly on negative uh, emotions. We all use uh, social networks. We know that there are hates, there's hate speech, uh, that there's uh, online uh, attacks, uh, misogyny, religious uh, attacks, uh, racial attacks. Uh, and so it's truly important to have tools uh, at our disposal that can acknowledge when these messages are uh, posted online. It is uh, also interesting for social platforms because they want to be moderators uh, and act very rapidly on hate speech. Uh, and the moderators on uh, other platforms are uh, people, are a pool of people. And uh, people, uh, therefore, do not act and react as, as uh, swiftly. And so now they have uh, been uh, uh, using automatic uh, systems uh, in uh, social platforms. And in fact, you can see uh, that often in social networks, you will see messages, uh, automatic messages uh, that uh, say, this is an offensive message. And uh, sometimes it may occur that these messages are not offensive. So this is an extremely interesting environment. We are very interested in studying how uh, cognitive information is validated. What is the information that we want to express? What is the emotion uh, that changes from one language to another? And how these emotions are expressed in different cultures, in different countries. And so we're carrying out this extremely interesting research. Interesting because it has a, a social impact. Uh, hate online is uh, highly impactful, especially for youngsters uh, and teenagers. It has uh, many negative impacts. And even uh, governments are asking uh, for uh, um, social platform to counter this. Even the European uh, Union uh, uh, has asked to uh, respond to uh, alerts on social platforms uh, within 24 hours. And so if social uh, platforms has accepted this, is because there is a, a speedy system that can uh, really uh, immediately act upon these uh, situations. So this is the core of my presentation. How do we acknowledge emotions by these moderation centers? So uh, this is a state of the art uh, um, technology. We, uh, like many other uh, groups, uh, work on these uh, systems. These are AI uh, um, systems. They use uh, machine learning, and they are supervised. They learn uh, from examples. I'm not convinced that these systems uh, have a consciousness uh, or uh, have uh, their own uh, autonomy or independence, but they uh, run uh, via uh, mimicry. And so uh, if uh, uh, the system is aware of hate uh, messages, more and more it will uh, learn to mimic my decision when I have uh, analyzed the data. So to make this uh, system successful, we need to have uh, uh, quite a numerous number of annotated data. and. Uh, these are uh, data sets for training, and uh, there are a, sort of uh, a couple of thousands that are needed. The um, users uh, are linguists, uh, students, uh, teenagers. In the past, we've worked uh, with uh, NGOs, uh, task force uh, that um, uh, work uh, uh, to uh, avoid hate speech or they are uh, collected via crowd uh, sourcing uh, platforms. And we do not really know uh, who is monitoring these annotated data. So if training is uh, uh, supervised, uh, 
by us uh, through uh, machine learning. Now, the last uh, model that has uh, imposed itself is the language model. Well, this uh, is a model that represents language. So, like people, when they learn a language and then uh, when following instructions uh, can carry out uh, a task, uh, well, this is done with the algorithms. I teach uh, something to the system and then I uh, give a mathematical model to the uh, machine uh, by um, uh, uploading uh, thousands and thousands uh, of documents. The larger the data set, the better, because the language can be better taught. So in Italian, for example, I will collect all of the information that I can collect uh, in Italian, the web, Wikipedia, uh, the more the better. And then I will come up with a, a model so that the algorithm, when I make a decision, will uh, match data and the model. And this creates a background where my system knows the grammar of Italian, the terms, the most frequent associations between words, adjectives, and nouns. So the system learns, not because I have given the Italian grammar rules, but because the algorithm has collected all of the, has received all of the data that I have uploaded. And so when I present tweets, that are not in training system, uh, it will be able to say this is a hate tweet and this can be shown. These uh, systems work very, very well, especially uh, with uh, English because uh, we have uh, a lot of training data on that and so we get a 90% accuracy. Facebook, for example, uh, informed us that they use a filtering system that uh, are 93, 94% accurate. And uh, they also say that uh, the uh, few mistakes that are made, uh, they can uh, be uh, uh, examined. And in the la last few years, uh, once using uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning, well, they are not transparent. The decisions that are made uh, can not be understood. Why did this system make this decision? So sometimes to understand why the system has made a decision, I have to go backwards, understand from previous mistakes, and understand what the system analyzed once it took the it made the decision. And this. Uh, the system uh, that makes these decisions on uh, emotions, we have seen this emerge, is that the system has learned biases and they use uh, these biases when uh, they have their decision making. And these biases can be a couple. The first source, for example, training data, the uh, data I uh, use to annotate uh, to the system so as uh, for it to learn. Uh, I do not need many of these, but they have to be clearly chosen so as and selected so that the system can really clearly understand and, and uh, avoid the misconceptions. A very uh, famous uh, uh, example in text analysis communities uh, was uh, on the first data set uh, that uh, was um, used to uh, study um, misogyny online. There were many tweets uh, online that uh, focused on on football, on soccer, because, you know, uh, soccer uh, had been used to uh, channel misogynist messages. And so when the system made decisions on uh, soccer, they said, well, this is misogynist because uh, the data set was misrepresented and so the uh, system had uh, this uh, misconception. And only uh, by analyzing the data set, we were able to understand, understood that the training data 
had to be collected in a more attentive and careful way. Another source of, of bias, and this is difficult to, to correct, is who is the uh, data annotator. They have to make decisions on the tweet and decide whether that tweet uh, uh, channels and conveys a, a, a certain negative um, emotion. Of course, our experience, uh, our philosophy, our moral entity will uh, clash with somebody else's, and it's not easy to uh, solve this via technology, but this, of course, impacts the way in which the system works. And so often we uh, uh, feed uh, um, concepts of that clash one with the other. Uh, for example, on the 8th of uh, March, there were a number of uh, messages uh, posted by men where their intention was to compliment women or to uh, channel convey uh, messages of love, of esteem, of affection. And the system instead understood these comments negatively, so very condescending, very patronizing because they celebrated women as moms or wives and on Twitter therefore with these categories annotating the data the data would be clashing so we need to keep in mind that the profile of annotators has to be very very clear these uh, uh, people have to be very well trained so as to allow their um, best way of, uh, uh, you know, being um, uh, independent and uh, not influenced uh, by uh, these uh, things uh, when chosen. Now, the uh, training uh, we've uh, spoken about, uh, and uh, so uh, the systems and the centers that uh, create uh, the uh, data sets uh, are shared with the scientific community in Italy. We have five or six models. In English, we have more models, but uh, given the fact that it's uh, not uh, that cost effective to create uh, these uh, models of uh, calculus, uh, the same model is used uh, to uh, carry out different uh, uh, tasks, uh, answering, uh, semantic extraction, uh, emotion annotation. So we must be very, very careful when uh, creating uh, language models, because if there's a bias in the language model, then it will impact all the uh, tasks uh, the system will be used uh, for. We are becoming more and more aware in our community and the fact that we have to be very, very carefully careful when studying language models because there are some problems, you see. In Wikipedia is one of uh, the uh, sources we use. It's uh, free, it's available, it contains information uh, that uh, uh, should not be subjective, but objective, so verified and trustworthy. So it's one of the sources that we use, but we all know that uh, even in the Wikin Wikipedia, there are uh, the female uh, scientists are underrepresented. And this means that my model will learn that this domain is mainly male and adjective will be used in the male manner. And this uh, occurs uh, for uh, most of the terms. So dancing, ballet is a female aspect. Uh, uh, childbearing, uh, uh, child education is female. Soccer playing is a male uh, uh, domain. And all of these aspects uh, are understood online, therefore, and uh, there are biases that are uh, expressed uh, and uh, the algorithm learns from us uh, the bias. All of this uh, with uh, these uh, sources uh, uh, feed into our systems. This is what social network platforms are offering us and I think they are pretty effective in doing so. Now, um, we may have problems or you know different types of bias that pop up 
every time we uh, need to uh, you know make decisions or uh, annotate new uh, data sometimes the system is good and right in, in, in predicting but almost always for example uh, some messages containing bad words well they are considered offensive by algorithms uh, it is not always like this okay so the system you know uh, learns that this kind of correlation having to do with hatred okay so almost always when they see a bad word they think it's offending someone Many offending messages also are linked to the identities of people, categories, religion, ethnic groups, sexual orientation. So these systems have a negative bias. If I talk about homosexuality in a tweet, the system, you know, quite often may say that that title is offending someone, even if this is not true. If we align systems by taking data for quite a long time where things happen, the system sort of uh, digests all of the uh, you know, judgments. We've carried out a study on tweets having to do with the U.S. presidential campaigns and Trump. Many tweets offended Trump. Our system trained with that data now understands that when talking about Trump, it's always uh, something offending someone. So you always have to consider that the uh, well domain changes, so the system has to be able to adapt. I have to uh, constantly update data to um, you know update it just like we do with human beings. Now, a major issue um, that we observed uh, is the dialects, or let's say, uh, well, sort of jargons of online community. You know, inside the community of people uh, sharing something, they use a common language. Now, this is a way to feel closer to the rest of the team or to show empathy or that you are part of a group. But this is an issue for systems and algorithms that have to recognize emotions. Uh, this is a famous example. A study was made in the US. They saw that systems recognizing hatred online have a prejudice against the Afro or oh, African Americans. Because, I mean, we understood why. Annotators who annotated data on American English were basically white with a bias, or maybe uh, they didn't understand the African-American slang, so when they saw those messages, they said, well, this is probably offensive. The system has interiorized or digested, if you will, the bias, and that it keeps reproducing it during the moderation phase. Now, the problem of communities and minority ethnic groups, this is a big issue, because in the future, moderation systems may be left independent, so they may be uh, not followed by people, so it would be a pity, because we would, let's say, not give voice to minorities. If our systems are biased, well, this would um, definitely create a big problem. So social networks would you know, express the voice of the usual groups and usual communities which are already over-talking. Okay, this is it. But uh, before doing this, um, I'd like to tell you that we don't have to avoid, uh, I mean, artificial intelligence. I mean, we have bias, we are identifying them, we're trying to, uh, well, combat against them. And um, there's um, part of research, I am involved in, which is the uh, text analysis. Now we are deploying so many huge efforts to work on ethics and removing commonplaces and bias. I'm sure that many such problems will be solved in a few months or years. But the fact of finding bias and recognizing them, seeing them in algorithms, we can really, uh, well, we help ourselves uh, think of creating new algorithms. So, okay, this is it. That's my, that's my final slide. Okay then, thank you so much. Now, unfortunately, yes, uh, we are running late. It's 20 to 2. So, if you have questions, please send us uh, questions to our website. We will send them to speakers and when we will answer every single question. Maria Grazia will now be the chaperone, so she will take us around meet. Very interesting. So we can, you know, put together a small team and you can follow us. Okay. Once again, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye bye. Arrivederci.
Okay, well, I'll, we'll wait for you outside, okay? So if you want to stay and take a tour, you are welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stanca.